Okay. All right. All right. Good morning, everyone. Before we begin, I will take roll. I, Chairman Jeffrey Hildebrand, am present. Vice Chairman Bell. Present. Commissioner Abel. Present. Commissioner Doggett. Mr. Foster, Present. Mr. Patton, Present. Mr. Rowling, Present. Mr. Scott. Present. Okay, thank you. Uh, this meeting is called to order January 24, 2024 at 9.03 a.m. Before proceeding with any business, I believe Dr. Yaskowitz has a statement to make. A public notice of this meeting containing all items on the proposed agendas has been filed in the Office of the Secretary of State as required by Chapter 551, Government Code, referred to as the Open Meetings Act. I would like for this fact to be noted in the official record of this meeting. Uh, thank you, Director Yaskowitz. All right, Commissioners, as a reminder, please turn on your microphones and announce your name before you speak. Please remember to speak slowly for the court reporter. The first order of business is the approval of minutes from the previous work session held November 1st, 2023, which have already been distributed. Is there a motion for approval? Commissioner Bell makes a motion for approval. Is there a second? Able second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Thank you. Work session item number one, update on the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department's progress in implementing the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department Land and Water Resources Conservation and Recreation Plan. Dr. Yaskowitz, will you make your presentation? Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. For the record, my name is David Yaskowitz, Executive Director of Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. I would like to provide you an update germane to the land and water related plan and functions inside the department. As is customary, I will start with an internal affairs update. The Office of Internal Affairs is responsible for upholding the best interest and confidence of the public and department employees. They conduct and complete objective and independent investigations of alleged employee misconduct. Due to a recent retirement, a search to fill staff services officer position ensued. This position is critical aspect to the units it supports and is responsible for providing advanced administrative support, managing daily operations, conducting information system and data management, as well as extensive coordination of staff services and other requests. The Office of Internal Affairs and Internal Audit are pleased to announce the newest addition to their teams, Ms. Beth Hibbs, who joined the team to fulfill these important roles on November 1st, 2023. Next, I would like to officially and finally recognize, where's Tim? Tim there's Tim Birdsong, who took over the Inland Fisheries Division Director position effective November 1st. Tim is no stranger to leadership roles with the Inland Fisheries Division and performed admirably in the acting interim role since July of last year when Craig Bonds became Chief Operating Officer. Tim's passion for fishing, aquatic resources stewardship, and building collaborative relationships is evident in each of his prior department inland fisheries roles, such as federal aid coordinator, habitat conservation branch chief, and then deputy division director, and now finally division director. Tim is a 17 year veteran of the department and brought valuable experience and insight with him from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Tim is a graduate of the National Conservation Leadership Institute, Governor Center for Management Development, Senior Management Program, and the Department's Natural Leaders Program. Tim's work has focused on collaborative partnerships, strategic and organizational planning and implementation, program development and delivery. His recognitions include recipient of the Fly Fishers International Conservation Award, National Fish Habitat Award, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Conservation Award, and the James A. Henshaw Warm Water Fisheries Award, just to name a few. Tim has a knack for creatively planning and leveraging funding and other resources towards putting vision into action through collaborative teams. Please join me in congratulating Mr. Tim Birdsong on his new role within the agency.
Next, we would like to recognize Kaylee Birchfield, who began her job as a recruiter with the Department in Human Resources four years ago. She made it her goal to hire a workforce that is reflective of Texas. She started by looking at everything related to recruitment. What are the metrics? What are, where are we recruiting? What are the colleges and universities that we're targeting? Are the places that we visit showing any results? And who can we partner with to affect change? Kaylee took the lead in encouraging discussions that focus on these results. And for that effort, she earned the 2023 Southeastern Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies Leadership Award. Kaylee has focused her efforts on serving as a liaison for the department's Al Henry program, which is focused on recruitment of minority students for internships. This is in partnership with funding support from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation. The program has provided funding for students interns from Houston Tolston University. Kaylee also is actively adding new universities, such as the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, a Hispanic serving institution, and is currently working with Prairie View A&M. She leads the agency's efforts on the Skill Bridge program, a program that provides military service members the opportunity to intern and transition from military service to the civilian workforce. Kaylee and her team have worked to make it easier for the direct hire of veterans into positions at the department. Kaylee is results oriented and committed to seeking out new opportunities to meet our future workforce challenges. Congratulations, Kaylee, on serving as a leader at the department and throughout the conservation community. Kaylee. Next, we'd like to recognize um, some, award for, some awards for, the Texas, for Texas State Parks. In October of 2023, the Texas Travel Alliance named Texas State Parks the 2023 Heritage Award winner at their annual Texas Travel Summit. The Texas Travel Alliance is the primary advocate and voice for Texas travel industry in the state. The selection is based on the organization demonstrating a history of exceptional achievement, exemplary business practices, innovative corporate culture, and a commitment of excellence to their customers and their community. One of the Texas State Park System's key contributions to the tourism industry lies in its capacity to attract a diverse array of visitors both in-state and out-of-state. Based on zip code data collected through the park business system, in 2022, State Parks welcomed roughly 685,000 visitors from out-of-state. These included visitors from all 50 U.S. states and 51 other countries. The greatest international visitation came from Canada, England, and Germany. This diverse appeal of our state parks has led to over 9 million annual visitors driving year-round visitation and providing a substantial economic boost to nearby communities. And in fact, in 2018, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation commissioned a report called the Economic Contributions of Texas State Parks. And what the research showed was that state parks generate more than $891 million in sales activities throughout the state and had $240 million impact on the incomes of Texas residents and supported an estimated 6,081 jobs throughout the state. It is this award announcement of the Texas Travel Alliance noted that Texas State Parks stands as a testament to the interplay between tourism, conservation, and cultural heritage. Congratulations, Rodney and team. Next, I'd like to talk about a uh, opportunity that has presented itself to the department as a result of legislation that occurred last session. During the 88th legislative session, House Bill 4018 passed and became effective on September 1st of 2023. This legislation allows the department to enter into agreements through an innovative conservation model providing both conservation and carbon credit based revenue to the agency. It also authorizes the Department of Nature based structures on land primarily used for game or fish conservation protection or management. Additionally, projects may be constructed on department land primarily used for parks, recreation and historic sites as well. Multiple divisions, and in particular Robin Rikers and Tammy Dunham, led the charge to develop the first solicitation for the construction of a nature-based carbon sequestration infrastructure project on TPWD property. 
Private money may fund construction adjacent to select public lands, and the department will deposit any funds received for that purpose to the benefit of either state parks or game and fish management, depending upon where the project is located. We are preparing to move as quickly as possible to secure additional partnerships that will benefit Texas and help support our mission. We appreciate the opportunity to provided by HB 4018 and the leadership of Chairman Trent Ashby, Ashby Senator Lois Kolkhorst, and Governor Abbott, who signed the bill into law on June 2nd of last year. The department expects partners to fund all construction costs, maintain and repair structures for the life of the agreement, and share in generated revenue as a result of the carbon credits. An example would be the J.D. Murphy WMA shoreline project in the Salt Bayou unit, which is currently in the solicitation phase, and that solicitation closes on uh, February 15th. The request for proposals will then spur on action in which we generate additional revenues to the department through protecting shorelines and also capturing carbon credit revenue. Next, I'd like to talk and give updates on the land and water plan and the progression. With the approval of the department's land and water resources conservation and recreation plan at last November's commission meeting, I'm going to be giving these updates at every commission meeting going forward. Staff are developing a dashboard for reporting our progress, and that will be coming soon. We'll provide graphical analysis of our progress as well as numeric metrics. For the first quarter of fiscal year 2024, which is September 1st through November 30th of 2023, I would like to highlight the following items. Action item 1.7, the goal is to stock 41 million fish fingerlings annually in Texas public waters. While most of this, public, this stocking will take place in the summer months, so far we have uh, put in 5.8 million fingerlings throughout the state, 5.4 of those have been in coastal waters, and over 356,000 in inland waters. Action item 3.1, add 82,000 acres to the state park system by 2033. Infrastructure Division's land conservation program staff closed on land acquisitions at Lake Brownwood State Park and Goliad State Park in November of 2023. The Lake Brownwood uh, acquisition added 869 acres to the park, including a significant amount of shoreline almost more than doubling the acreage, and the Goliad State Park acquisition added 40 acres to the park, eliminating an important inholding that separated two parts of the park. Additionally, Action Item 11.5, to introduce 2,000 Texans to the camping and outdoors through the Texas Outdoor Family Workshops. We have a total of 1,088 Texans who were introduced in the first quarter of last year. 11 public camping workshops served 220 youth and 212 adults were hosted. 21 commuter community partner camping workshops served 359 youth and 297 adults were hosted. And then finally, action item 14.2, complete 30 local park construction projects annually, annually supported through the Recreation Grants Program. Eight projects, projects were completed in the first quarter of this past, uh, this past year. Uh, examples include the Heritage Park at Leon River in Belton, the Trevino Park in Beeville, and Paradise Pond in Port Aransas. And with that, Chairman, that concludes my presentation, and I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you, Director Oskowitz. Any uh, questions or comments by the Commission? It's Commissioner Bell, um, one question, David, on, on the last item on 11.5, um, uh, the, the um, the campers um, exposed. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that um, I'm, I'm aware of that, but I wanted to make sure that we have a tie-in for, for the Urban Outreach Committee because they've been put in. I, I don't know if some of the activities there are captured here. They probably are, but I just wanted to make sure that we capture those activities as well so that your numbers are reflect that. Are, are reflecting that. And, and again, they may be included there. I'm just not aware. Maybe David David might know or, or someone else. Yeah, I, I, I'll follow up on that, okay. Chairman. And, and, and I, I would imagine they are, but let me follow up. Or, Thank you. Vice Chairman, let me follow up with that. Yep. Any other, que Any other questions? Uh, Director Yaskowitz, on carbon sequestration, uh, that... Give us a little more detail on that. Uh, that is a submittal that any individual or, or agency can make 
Well, so it's a request for proposals currently for that project at the W at the MRF. Um, the uh, companies can make that proposal bid on that project, but it's going to take substantial resources to, to do that because we're talking over 39,000 linear feet of living shoreline that will have to be established. So th that's what we're looking for at this time. I don't know, Robin or Tammy, do we have any proposals that have been submitted at this point? Okay. So that is, it, we're looking for established companies that have enough capital to, to enter into these. I see. I, that, that's something. Isn't Jim Blackburn doing something uh, of that nature, building, trying to build reefs and uh, to protect wetlands, which then has a whole calculation as to carbon sequestration? That, Is that's that right? Correct. That's correct. And so he, a group of his, may submit for that type of application? Yes. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're available to do that as well as anybody else. Okay, yep. great. And then just secondly, on the, the recreational park program that we've got, which I think is just fantastic, uh, that is a much beloved program, I suspect. And kind of uh, uh, elaborate a bit on that. Does, how, how helpful is that to these communities? And are the vast majority of them, um, the, they just don't have the budget to kind of enhance, because this is generally around an enhancement of an existing park? Well, it can be enhancements of existing recreational facilities or new city or county parks. So uh, the, the amount that the department uh, pushes out every year varies, but let's say about around 25 million, but that can go up or down depending on, on budget and, and other needs. Um, it, it's incredibly impactful, especially for those small communities that want to improve parks get new parks in there. The challenge that we also find, though, is that some of those, a lot of those smaller communities need some hand-holding from the department, which we provide to get them through the application process. But it's, it's really impactful. Yes, sir. You know, as we think about the use of the Centennial Fund moving forward, I think a really exciting opportunity is with these resource-starved municipalities who have acreage available that somehow can partner with TPWD, where maybe we take a lease, we acquire the acreage, we uh, agree to install the infrastructure and run it. I mean, it could be a really kind of quick hit on how do we expand the park system uh, in the state of Texas. And so that's an area that I really want to work on is with mayors of all these big and small towns that really just don't have the budget to uh, build and or maintain these parks. I mean, I see it in the city of Houston right now. Uh, they just don't have any budget for, for parks, and they're starved for them. So yeah. it's, a, it's an area that I just I really want to focus on because uh, I think, you know, it can just be such enhancement to small and large cities. Great, Joe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, let's see. Work session item number two, uh, financial overview, Mr. Reggie. Uh, Pegas? Peg How do you pronounce close it? Um, Pegas. Pegas. Okay. No, it wasn't close at all. Sorry. Right. <laughs> uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, Vice Chairman, Commission members. Uh, for the record, my name is uh, Reggie Pegas, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, this morning, I will be presenting the financial overview uh, covering the following topics, fiscal year uh, revenue summaries, uh, FY24 revenue summaries through December, and FY24 budget adjustments through December. And these summaries will cover the uh, primary revenue sources for the agency, license revenue, state parks revenue, and boat revenues. Uh, first up, we have license revenue. Final uh, FY23 revenues were $111.1 million, about 1.6% behind the final numbers for license year uh, 22, but uh, still strong compared to the pre-COVID years of uh, LY19 and before. Next is a monthly comparison of that license revenue. Uh, following the typical seasonal pattern, about 70% of the revenues occurred at the beginning of the season through uh, from September through uh, December, and then a leveling off for the remainder of the year for the total of 111 million. Next, we have a two-year comparison by license type. 
Uh, you'll see a slight decline across all lines for a total variance, again, of only 1.6%. Moving on to state parks, final FY23 revenues for state parks were 62.6 million, slightly behind the record pace of 21 and 22, but still far in excess of the pre-COVID years of, of FY20 and FY19. Next, we have a monthly comparison of uh, state parks revenue, and you'll see the typical seasonal pattern with uh, the most revenues occurring from March through August in the uh, busy peak periods. Next, we have a two-year comparison by uh, revenue type. You will see a 5.8% increase in activities and concessions, offset by a slight decline in the other uh, uh, revenue categories, ending out a total variance of 3.5%. Next, we move over to uh, boat revenues. Final FY23 boat revenues of 23.7, slightly behind, again, the record years of FY21 and 22 but still outpacing the pre-COVID years. Next is a monthly comparison of vote revenue. Uh, once again, you'll see that the peak activity is in the uh, spring and summer months from March through the end of the fiscal year, August. Next, we have a two-year comparison by uh, revenue type, uh, showing a distribution of the slightly kind across reg uh, registration titles and retained sales. Again, a variance of 3.4%. Next, we move on to the FY24 summaries through December 31st. Uh, first up, we have a five-year summary of license revenue through December. Year-to-date revenues of 74.9 are, st are tracking strongly with uh, FY23. There's about a half percent variance between the two years. Next is the monthly comparison of license revenue through December. Uh, December revenues of 6.7, or about 2% higher than the same period this time last year. Next, we have a license revenue comparison by type, 5.2% uh, increase in resident hunt, offset by small declines in the uh, other licenses for 0.4%, uh, again, less than a half percent variance. Uh, moving on to state parks, we have a five-year comparison of revenue. FY24 revenues uh, to year-to-date of 19.0 million were, were actually outpacing FY23 by a million dollars. Next is the monthly comparison of state parks revenue. Uh, December revenues of 4.7 million outpaced last December by about 9%. Next is a two-year comparison of state parks revenue. You'll see an increase across all lines uh, for a positive variance of 5.6%. Uh, finally, moving over to uh, boat revenues, uh, we began with a five-year comparison of boat revenues through December 31st. Uh, total revenues are 4.3 million, uh, declined from FY23, and this is the one area that we're kind of back towards uh, the actual pre-COVID numbers. If you'll see FY20, we're in track with FY20 so far through this uh, fiscal year. Next is the monthly comparison of boat revenue. Uh, revenues of 700,000 for December or 15% behind the same period last year. And finally, a two-year comparison of FY23 and FY24 uh, just showing the decline across all lines, uh, registration, titles, and retained uh, sales tax. Next up are uh, FY budget adjustments through December. I'll start with the number um, that you approved in the commission, August commission meeting of $1.96 billion, which includes a billion dollars for the Centennial Fund, which uh, passed, so that remains in our budget. Uh, since that since that time, we've had some small tweaks to the budget, about a 3% variance versus the original budget. Uh, we've had 29.3 million of adjustments uh, since the August commission meeting for FY24. Uh, in order of amount, the largest increase was 24. Point million for employee fringe. Uh, this covers amounts such as retirement, Social Security, and insurance. These are estimates based on payroll activity throughout the year. Um, and the thing about these adjustments is that year-end, 
whatever the final expenditures are, we adjust the budget to equal actual expenditures for that. So this number will change as we expend funds throughout the fiscal year. Uh, the next category is appropriated receipts of 11.9 million. Uh, the majority of that are donations made on behalf of the agency, uh, credit card fee recovery costs, and about 3.2 million of cost recoveries related to Operation Lone Star uh, down at the border. And then some small adjustments for federal funds and capital constructions. Again, total adjustments of 29.3 million, giving us an adjusted budget at December of 1.98 billion. Uh, this concludes my presentation. I'll take any questions at this time. Great. Uh, any questions or comments by the commissioners? Uh, the only question I've got is, have we, um, in terms of the recurring um, uh, revenue on licenses and automatic renewals, have we made any progress on that, Dr. Yaskowitz? Chairman, yeah, so we, the, the team is going through the process of streamlining, first off, streamlining the licenses. So consolidating licenses where it makes sense, eliminating, eliminating other licenses that don't make sense to have any longer. And then once that process is done, then the next step will be to integrate that automatic renewal opportunities um, and, and other options. Yes. Good. Yep. When, when do you think that might happen? Uh, by next hunting season? No, so I think we have a we have a little bit longer. Go ahead. Yeah. Please, Jamie. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman. For the record, my name is Jamie McClanahan, IT. We are working with DIR to ensure that we have everything in place to do that. We right now just started that conversation with them, so it may be um, not this next fiscal year, but the following. And, and DIR? Oh, Department of Information Resources with state the state agency. of Texas. Yeah. Okay. So, which involves Texas by Texas and the processing. Uh, the vendor that processes that is through DIR. Okay. Well, just as you know, quickly as we can expedite that, that'd be great. I mean, it'd be wonderful if we could get it by next hunting season, but. I understand. Push yes, hard. Sir. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Thanks. And and then the last is, do we have a program for? state parks where you can buy a pass that gives you admittance to every park for, I don't know, $100 gets you kind of visits to all, all the parks. Do we have that program? Well, we have an annual state parks pass program and then variations on that. I'm going to let Rodney address that. Um, I, I don't know if you're asking about a gift cards or no a, I'm, I'm just saying if i want to visit every state park in the state of texas and that would cost me x to do it individually can i just go buy a pass for 200 bucks and yes sir for the record rodney franklin state park director we do have a texas state park pass a lot of very popular program it is 75 dollars uh, i think we're looking at a price increase on, on that coming up in in the fall but it'll be about a hundred dollars uh 95 dollars but it gets you and your family or you and everybody in your vehicle into any Texas State Park for free for a full year. Great. Okay. It might be good to include that in your automatic renewal program. Yes, sir. Be nice to just be able to renew it automatically every year. Sure. Yes. I, I think currently, uh, just to speak on that a little bit, there is a notice that you have your card. You can go online and renew it and just keep the same card. So but we might want to do it for them. And uh, just so. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. All right. Thanks. Uh, okay. Commissioner Abel, just want to sir. talk about that. A few meetings ago, I think we had a conversation about an option for a lifetime state parks license and maybe the option of adding it to the lifetime hunting license, just sort of a super, super combo. Are we anywhere on that? Yes, sir. Um, we do have a lifetime a annual pass. Currently, our rules uh, permit the executive director um, by approval to issue that pass. We don't currently sell that pass. Um, it was there's some history behind how that was developed, but there is a gold Texas State Park pass that can be issued at the behest of the, the director, uh, executive director. We've issued it in special circumstances for special needs. Um, for the department. So we do have that and we can explore options to sell it if that's what you're looking to do. I, I think that would be good to, to put that up for sale. Okay, we'll, we'll, we will look into that as well. Thank you. 
Okay. All right. Uh, thanks very much. Um, work session item number three, internal audit update. Ms. Brandy Meeks, please make your presentation. Good morning, Chairman, Vice Chairman, Commissioners. For the record, my name is Brandy Meeks. I'm the internal audit director. This morning, I'd like to update you on our fiscal year 23 and 24 internal audit plans our recent external audits and assessments, as well as introduce you to the peer review team who, who conducted our external quality assurance review. So this slide shows the status of our fiscal year 23 internal audit plan. Please take note of the yellow font under the status to the right. Those are the projects that have progressed since the last time we've met. We are currently in the reporting phase for the TAC 202 cybersecurity audit, and we have now completed all 18 of our fiscal control audits. So this plan is pretty much done. Our current audit plan, we've also made some progress on. Um, if you'll notice under the advisory projects, we are now in the field work phase for the infrastructure change order process advisory, and in the reporting phase for the C-Center point of sale inventory advisory. We are also working to follow up on any audit items due for remediation during the first two quarters of this year. Um, we have also attended one meeting for the BRITS rewrite, and we hope to attend many other meetings um, that we're invited to, so that we can just be a fly on the wall during that project. And then we are also working to fill two internal audit vacancies at this time. As far as fiscal control audits are concerned, um, we've made progress with our law enforcement office um, fiscal control audits. We have completed four of those, and we are currently actually in the field work phase now for the Corpus Christi Law, Enforce Law Enforcement Office. As far as external audits and assessments are concerned, um, the same three projects that were on uh, the slides the last time we met are still ongoing. Nothing's been completed since the last time we met. We've got the Deepwater Horizon Texas Trustee Audit of the Statement of Receipts and Expenditures for Fiscal Years 20 through 22 the Office of the Governor's Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund project is still ongoing, as well as the Comptroller's Post-Payment Audit. So this concludes my internal audit update. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them before I move on to introduce our peer review team. Great. Thanks. Any questions, comments by the Commissioner? All right. Okay. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce Ms. Melvin. She served as our peer-reviewed team lead um, on our current quality assurance assessment. She is the chief auditor for the Texas Department of Public Safety. She has over 25 years' experience as the chief audit executive for various state agencies. She is a certified public accountant and certified internal auditor. She's also a respected leader in our internal audit community. She served as vice chair of the Institute of Internal Auditors International Public Sector Guidance Committee, which, which issued guidance for governmental auditors worldwide. She currently leads the Internal Audit Leadership Development Program for state agency, as well as serves as the recorder for the state agency internal audit, audit forum. And she also recently completed a six-year term as an elected trustee for the Texas Empl Employees Retirement System Board of Trustees. She has also led numerous peer reviews for state agency internal audit functions. Mr. Bowles served as the peer review team member on this assessment, and he is an audit manager for Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. He has over 22 years' experience as an internal auditor for state agencies. He has conducted performance, compliance, management control, and advisory service engagements during his 20-plus years in government auditing. He's a certified internal auditor and a certified government, government auditing professional. So I feel very fortunate to have had these um, very knowledgeable leaders in our community to audit our audit shop. So with that, I'd like to welcome Ms. Melvin and Mr. Bolts. Welcome back to TPWD. Good morning, Chairman and Commission. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, <clears throat> as uh, Ms. Meeks mentioned, we have recently concluded a peer review. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, um, essentially the auditors periodically have to be audited by other auditors. Uh, this is to ensure that uh, they are in compliance with uh, a numerous uh, internal auditing standards, uh, IIA, uh, federal standards, as well as Texas government code. And the most restrictive of these is uh, a three-year period, so it has to be conducted each three years. Um, with that, I will give you Ms. Melvin to provide the results. All right. 
sorry, I fell behind on my clicking duties. I went, I went too fast. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, before we give you the final results of the peer review, um, I always like this slide just to kind of pause here um, and just to kind of reinforce that a review of the internal audit function is not just a review of your internal audit director. It's really looking at three components and how well those work together because it really takes the <coughs> governing board, executive management, and your internal audit audit uh, director to work in concert with one another to have an effective internal audit function. So we really looked at how those three things work well together. Um, and with that, uh, our, unfortunately, our standards limit the language that we can use. And so while this sounds a bit underwhelming, please trust that that is the highest of three possible ratings. Um, internal auditors are, you know, we, we are uh, risk averse. Um, but yes, uh, the, our uh, conclusion is, is that your internal audit function does reach the highest level of possible ratings. Um, just a couple other things we have. Um, Ian and I looked at a lot of things. As he mentioned, uh, job one was to look at compliance and to ensure that your internal audit function um, meets all the standards. And so that was definitely a yes. Um, but we also looked at some best practices and was there anything maybe within our combined experience that we could share with you all and of course with Ms. Meeks about how um, you might uh, improve things or enhance things, if you will. And so start with some of the highlights. Um, these are some of the comments that we heard over and over again, and, and in our review, uh, we were very impressed with too. So number one, the risk assessment process. Um, I know you all are very familiar with that. Uh, Mr. Scott, I think you spoke a little bit about this, um, about how each person or each member of management has the opportunity to provide input and ultimately leading up to that audit plan. And so that audit plan is really reflective of the vision um, of senior management and of course of the governing board and what you want the internal audit to, uh, function to be focused on. Uh, the second thing was that this uh, team was very professionally staffed. Uh, while not large, um, we'll talk more about that later, uh, uh, four of the five members carry professional certification. So that is very important. Um, number three, uh, consistently in surveys and in interviews, um, your internal auditors are very well regarded. So we had very positive comments consistently, again, both in interviews and in surveys about Ms. Meeks and her team uh, as well. And then lastly, uh, we just uh, wanted to uh, commend Ms. Meeks because she is a recognized leader in the internal audit community, which you may not be aware of, but certainly in, in the circles that we run with, um, she is very uh, well respected. She is the current uh, chair of the State Agency Internal Audit Forum. Uh, it's a two-year term, and um, so uh, she is very, very well thought of there. All right. And then uh, we uh, just have a few enhancement opportunities that we included in our report. Um, these are not compliance requirements. They're certainly, these are just, you know, some things we notice, and it's something um, that might be helpful to you all. And the first is, is to address the adequacy of the Office of Internal Audit Resources. And so just looking at the size of the shop, looking at the turnover that they've had, uh, at the time of our review, uh, five out of seven positions were staffed. I think that's where they're still at now. And so if you think about that, that's, you know, they're operating at two-thirds capacity. And so imagine any of your divisions running at two-thirds capacity, um, you know, could certainly have an impact. Um, the second uh, recommendation we have is to clarify the reporting relationship. Um, and this is a... a more about ensuring the independence of the function. Um, and uh, I have, a, we, you know, we're internal auditors, so we have a lot of common, in the independence of your internal audit function is what makes your in, internal audit valuable. So that's really important for both management, for you as a governing board, is that you need your internal auditor to be independent so that whatever they say, if they say positive things or they say enhancements are needed, you can rely upon um, that work. Um, in, Independence is not something that the internal audit director can create or, or, you know, make for themselves. It's something that can only be granted by you. And so only the governing board can provide that independence and ensure that independence. And so the things that you do 
including, you know, approving the audit plan, you know, signing the charter, um, conducting a performance evaluation or reviewing her um, compensation, you know, uh, staffing, resources, those types of things are the things that you do to ensure that independence. Um, and then the last is just to update charters, and this is a little more administrative, uh, but we noticed uh, the last time the charter was signed, there was a different chairman and a different uh, audit subcommittee chair, and so um, uh, since you want to update the charter, it's a good opportunity to go through and ensure that it carries the language um, and specifies the responsibilities that you want uh, for your internal audit function. Okay. And then uh, with that, I think that's all we had. Um, we'd be happy to in answer any questions. Great. Any questions? Uh, this is Commissioner Bell. No, not a question, just a comment. One, I just wanted to thank both of you for the, for the work you did there and the interaction you had. And I know you spent a significant amount of time and also the, the time you spent interviewing commission members and other staff uh, to make sure you had the right information. So we appreciate the input. Great. Thank you very much. It's our pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, just a question. So you're on DPS and uh, TCEQ. So the internal audit, what you'll take different agencies, the auditors from from those agencies, and, and you'll audit another agency. And so who audits you? Right. So it can't be Brandy now, so she's out. <laughs> and it can't be Ian, because I work together on this project. Um, but we, I'll, like, when I'm, I'm due for a review next year, and so I'll be seeking somebody in the internal audit community to come and review, ensuring that uh, we kind of round robin to ensure independence. Okay. Uh, so I assume it's state law that, that our auditors mm -hmm. have got to be audited by someone else. Yes, it is, it is state law. It's also in our standards. Um, so it's a requirement, both statutory and by professional standards, that that happens. Okay. All right. Seems like a lot of work, but, uh, <laughs> but okay. Yeah. Understood. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Director Yoskowitz, let's look at the enhancement opportunities that we have, and let's, let's rectify those. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank right. you very much. Sorry. Next. Uh, work session item number four, 2024-2025, statewide recreational and commercial fishing proclamation. Spotted sea trout harvest rules recommended adoption of proposed changes. Mr. Geesland, please make your presentation. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Dr. Yoskowitz. For the record, my name is Dacus Geesland. I serve as our Deputy Director in the Coastal Fisheries Division. Uh, today I bring you a proposal related to spotted sea trout regulations. I'll start off with a timeline. This is really uh, kicked off, and what the reason I'm here today, kicked off on that benchmark storm, kind of the largest winter freeze-related fish kill we've had since the 1980s. You all recall that storm impacted spotted sea trout up to the tune of 160,000 spotted sea trout succumbed to that winter storm. Um, coastwide. Following that freeze, we enacted uh, emergency regulations, which took us through the fall of 2021. <clears throat> then we enacted some temporary regulations, which really extended from Matagorda all the way through the, uh, <clears throat> through the lower Laguna Madre to the, uh, to the Mexican border. Uh, those temporary regulations expired or sunset at the end of August 2023. And prior to that, we began hearing concerns from, from anglers about the, the need to keep those more restrictive harvest regulations in place to further accelerate some of the recovery that we did see in some of the base systems. So with that, we, uh, we recognized that need. We went out and we conducted public scoping to gather input from our angling community. We also contracted with the Texas A&M University to conduct an email-based survey. Uh, from both the survey from A&M and both from the, the public scoping meetings, and we talked about this in November, we saw that the majority of anglers were in favor of a more restrictive or a smaller bag limit and a tighter slot limit. Um, I provided this summary to you all in November, and to, then together we formulated that current proposal, which exists today, that three fish bag, a 15 to 20 inch slot limit, with the ability to harvest one trout over 25 inches, that oversized trout per day. 
you all recall this familiar graph. This is our gill net catch rates. This is how we, how we look at our, our trout abundance within the population. Uh, this is our primary tool in evaluating, evaluating stocks of our, our fin fish. Um, this graph shows the coastwide average spring gill net catch rates uh, with the years displayed on the x-axis and the catch rate displayed on the y-axis. That uh, white line is the 10-year average. Uh, the take home here, as you can see in those last, last three years after that COVID gap, take home here is the catch rate's been less than the, uh, than the 10 year average and some of the lowest we've seen since 2009. So again, our, our proposal today is a, a 15 to 20 inch slot limit, a three fish bag and one oversized trout that would be over 25 inches allowed as part of the daily bag limit. The expected benefits of the proposal in include several of the key components that we look at, and that, that primary benefit being an increase in the spawning stock biomass. We've talked about that a lot. That's simply the, the cumulative, cumulative weight of sexually mature uh, reproducing female trout within the population. That simply leads more, more of those females in the water to spawn, thus increasing our, our recruitment to the fishery and helping with getting those catch rates up. Uh, when we add the benefit of the bag and the slot limit coupled with that oversized fish per day, we'd expect a 25% increase in spawning stock biomass over a generation of trout. That's about seven years. Uh, but there's, there's benefits along the way. Um, within, within two years, we would expect about 70% of that percent increase to be realized. And after about four years, we'd expect about 90% of that increase to be realized as well. There's also, also that added, added benefit uh, of an increase in fish greater than 25 inches within the water. If we're protecting that, that size class from 20 to 25, you're allowing those to grow and presumably you reasonable expectation is those fish will enter into that greater than 25 inch size class. So we, I feel like that will give us a lot of the bang for the buck in achieving some of those bigger fish within the water. So following our proposal development there in our November commission meeting, we hit the ground, hit the coast rather, and held uh, six public hearings along the coast. We held uh, all the way from the uh, Louisiana border all the way down to the Mexican border. We also held a, a virtual public hearing. And all sum in total, we had about 400 individuals participate in either that public hearing process in person or about 130 within the, the virtual, virtual public hearing. We also develop a, uh, a public comment portal on our website so folks can share their position on any of these regulatory proposals online. And I'll talk about a summary of those public comments right now. Um, as of, we submitted this, this slide deck last Thursday. I wanted to just catch you up on a quick update. As of 12.30 p.m. yesterday, that co total comment number, we see it at 2280, that's jumped up to almost 2800. It, we're sitting right at about 27 and, and change. Um, and, but the percentages, what the relative percentages to those various comment categories, really hasn't changed that much, a percentage point or so. You'll see that 37% of the comments we received thus far are in support of the proposal. Uh, of note, our Coastal Resources Advisory Committee is in support of the proposal. They support the three fish bag and the 15 to 20 inch slot. However, they do recommend that we prohibit the take of an oversized trout until we have such time, until we have time to implement a tag system. So that would lead to one fish over 28 inches is what the committee, the advisory committee suggested per year. And that's similar to our red drum tag that we have in place right now. Uh, also, the Coastal Conservation Association or CCA is supportive of the proposal. They're supportive again of that three fish bag, the 15 to 20 inch slot. They're supportive of a, uh, a tag system as well and that we prohibit the take of an oversized trout over 25 inches until such time that we have an oversized tag system in place. Uh, they also recommend a forward-looking implementation date, so the license year 25-26, that turns about in September 1 of 2024, for adequate time for our, our staff and the department to implement that oversized tag system. 
Those in opposition of the proposal comprise 62%, and I'll really kind of unpack that category of opposition in these next two slides. 1% of the comments uh, were neutral to the proposal. All right, so within that category of opposition, I'll talk now about the varying degrees of opposition we received. Of all the comments we've received to date, 26.5% of those 26.5% of those completely opposed the proposal, all components of it, wholly opposed to the bag, the slot, the oversized fish. Uh, and this group of commenters felt that their desire to maintain the current regulations, the regulations were a government overreach, and limits in the form of regulation negatively impact coastal sport fishing, and the fishing trip expense was no longer worth going out to fish, and the regulations were not needed. So now hop down to those that partially opposed, partially opposed the proposal. This category of comments comprised 35.5% of the total comments. Now this category opposed just one or more of those components of the proposal, either the bag, the slot, or the oversized fish. So you could also interpret this as this, comment, this category of comments partially supported some of the proposal. Okay, so of those that partially oppose this, the proposal, the partial, partial opposition, the nature of those comments were the following. Uh, the desire to harvest at least one trout over 20 inches, uh, the desire, again, for an annual oversized tag as opposed to a daily allowance of one oversized as part of the bag limit. And I will share that that was the most commonly shared specific category of opposition that we saw. Uh, others felt that no retention, absolutely no retention of an oversized trout whatsoever. Uh, they felt the daily oversized catch is excessive and the concern that a proposal targets the large female trout and productive breeding fish. Um, now I will go with that. Uh, based, on the, based on our conversation here in November, uh, and based on the public comments that we received in opposition of the, of the one oversized trout per day and as part of the bag limit and the number of comments we received in support of a tag system for an oversized trout, much like the, again, much like the tag system we have available right now for a red drum, our team performed some additional analysis uh, related to that added benefit of a tag versus the daily oversized fish. So what you see here before you with the three fish bag and a 15 to 20 inch slot, one oversized fish per year, the benefits of the spawning stock biomass based on the various oversized classes here, you will see that a tag system of let's just say that 28 inch, 28 inch oversized fish tag, one per, one per year, would provide an additional 1% to the spawning stock biomass. That's in addition to that 25% that we talked about earlier. Uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and say this, I don't want to minimize the increase to spawning stock biomass, but there is, a, uh, there is additional benefit and value of keeping those bigger fish in the water. Uh, as, a, as a fellow angler, if I'm, you know, if there's more fish in the water, my odds of catching one of those bigger fish go up. Uh, a lot of folks are, are drawn to those bigger fish and that opportunity to catch those bigger fish within our bays and estuaries. Um, that's simply, simply an added benefit and an extra value in the way that our anglers specifically target those bigger fish. And I'll go ahead and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this, commissioners. Um, and it's not included on a slide, but um, we, experienced a, we experienced a minor freeze uh, last week. Last week, I feel like we, we dodged a bullet. Uh, most of the fish kills that our teams observed coastwide were in kind of small back isolated lakes, Pringle Lake, Vincent Slough, Fence Lake. Those are the areas that are typically, we know those are typically hit hard during those freezes. Um, and while that, that freeze of last week wasn't near as impactful as some of the freezes, more recent freezes, I, I believe it does highlight the, the vulnerable nature of our trout fishery to those freezes. Um, and, and the need, it really highlights the need to build resilience within that stock and be proactive with our management actions and, and enable those fish 
build a more robust trout stock, and enable those fish to weather, weather the so storm, so to speak, so they can recover quicker out of the next freeze event. It's not, an, it's not a when, if it's coming, it's a when. So with that, I uh, request this item be placed on the Thursday agenda for public comment and action, and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Geeslin. Uh, so any questions or comments of Mr. Geeslin by the commission? This is Commissioner Rowling. Sorry, maybe I didn't understand the, the previous slide. The, is the baseline it's showing at the bottom if we did issue a tag? Shouldn't the baseline be what we've proposed where it's unlimited? Well, it's not unlimited because you have a, a bag limit, but yeah. every day you can catch one over 25, right? That's correct. And that would, and that is, good question, Commissioner Rowling, and that is reflective in that 25. There's just so few of those fish caught that it really doesn't increase the spawning stock biomass. It increased it less than 1%. But as you get, the fish get bigger, they add more mass. They simply add more mass to that spawning stock biomass. So as you move up into bigger fishes, Got it. they contribute more to that spawning stock biomass. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, Dax, this is Commissioner Bell. Um, is, was there any additional thought or comment about um, instead of the 25-inch, maybe a 28- or 30-inch? Um, Certainly we've heard that from our Coastal Resource Advisory Committee. We've heard that through different public comments, and we've, that's why we provided this kind of that, those, that range of oversized trout. And, you know, I will remind the commission that we do have that oversized trout tag at 20, set at 28 inches with our red drum as well. And if, we, and if we did something like that, that would bring kind of the, would that bring the regulations more into, or the, the oversight more into alignment? Would it be easier on the oversight? I think from an end user angling perspective, I think it brings consistency within the regulations, I do. And, and lastly, just on, in terms of the implementing the tag system here, how, how onerous do you think that is on the angler to do that here? On the angler, I don't think it's very onerous at all. Um, I think it's probably more onerous on our, our team here. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So, I, uh, Commissioner Foster, I, I just I want to be sure I understand what it is you're proposing. Are you proposing that we implement the, the tag system, or are you proposing that we have the daily over? As it is right now, I'm proposing the one over per day. But I wanted to highlight the added benefit of that tag simply based on we had a fairly robust conversation about this in November, and we've also seen quite a few comments come in related to that, that practice of implementing a TAG system. But to your point, Commissioner Foster, my proposal is, is what it is that includes that one oversize per day, and that oversize would be at 25 inches. And, and, and it's still your opinion that, that, that that's the best approach, or you just kind of gone that far down the road and you don't want to change to the to the tag well i'll say the <laughs> i'll say anything can change but the proposal we gathered comments based on that specific proposal and i think there's some options out there but the the proposal is what it is today okay this is commissioner rolling dax would you even if we implement the proposal today, would you suggest that we move towards a tag system while it may take a couple seasons to get there? And, and when you said a second ago that it would be cumbersome on staff to do that, is that on the implementation side or is that kind of ongoing uh, monitoring of that? Yeah, no, great question. Um, to your first point, would I support that? I think that's a discussion we can have here. I think there is added benefit. I think there is added benefit. We've certainly heard it from our anglers. Um, it, it leaves those bigger fish in the water that draw folks to, you know, to catch those bigger fish, that draw folks from the various areas of Texas with that, that opportunity to catch those biggest fish. Related to the implementation, I can tell you after following our November conversation, we've had some extensive conversations internally with both our, our licensing team within financial resources, but also our IT team. And I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I'm, I've been assured that we could have a tag system in place 
by August 15th to be prepared for that next license year. Commissioner Bell again. So I, I guess what I'm hearing on one hand is um, there, may be, there may be a window of opportunity to address this issue again and that because the one thing that kind of threw me off initially was just the num the percentage in opposition but when you break down the opposition it actually it actually translates very very differently so and and you talked about the the impact over the the kind of that you called it the seven year lifespan or correct or and 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 where we are at, at two years with the 75 percent impact four years with the 90 percent impact so it seems that consideration of moving towards a, a tag is not, is not unwise and it seems like the, the 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 length of being a little longer is not is not unwise either i i don't want to dodge your question but i think there's an opportunity there's an opportunity here to vote this proposal up or down <coughs> and then come back, come back. I could also seek permission to, to publish within the, the Texas Register the notion of a tag and an associated fee with that tag. We could also make that movement and a, vote that one up or down in the March commission meeting. Now, Commissioner Scott, I don't know uh, because if this has any relation or correlation, but I've had some friends that born and raised in the Galveston area, and they're, they have commented to me recently, uh, about a month ago, they asked me a question, and I did not know the answer to it. I said, I've got a meeting coming, and I'll ask. And so, and I don't know if this ties in to what you're trying to accomplish by increasing our fish, but they, they told me that... Uh, different groups of them. One, the, I guess you'd call it the west, the west shore of Galveston Bay, that the grass is all, it's just basically yeah. gone. And then some others that discovered Matagorda Bay way back when it was huge, the grass and everything is gone out of a major amount of the shoreline on it. So, what is my answer to them about where has the grass gone and and in your experience what do you think effect that's having on the overall trout population to the grass and we are we are noticing some you know some declines within various species of seagrass especially on that upper coast a lot of that is it, there's several factors influencing that is as the farther up the coast you go the more muddy the water gets, that it's just simply more turbid. So that light, the sunlight, mm -hmm. isn't able to penetrate, yeah. penetrate through that water Thanks. column Thank to hit that seagrass, to to nourish that and provide it the sunlight it needs to grow. So we got a little, we got an issue there. There's probably some other factors there, uh, some nutrients at play in those those bigger areas, those bigger base systems that receive so much more of the water and receive a larger nutrient load that can impact those seagrass. And certainly, you know, uh, spawning sea, I mean, sp all spotted sea trout utilize various habitat features, and seagrass is a big one. Seagrass helps, you know, those, those fish kind of resort to cover, feed, um, nurture, grow, um, you know, hide from other predators. So, yeah, there's probably a little, little factor there that's, that's influencing some of, the, some of the spotted sea trout along the coast, not only in Galveston and, and Matagorda, but some of the other areas as well. Chairman, uh, Commissioner Abel. Oh. Um, just so I understand, the the restricted regulations that we passed before have expired. So currently, today you can keep five trout, correct? That is correct. Okay, within so, fifteen to twenty-five inches. Right. So yeah. if we voted this down tomorrow, then essentially we're allowing that five five fish bag to remain in place. Correct. So um, yeah, I'm in favor of of going ahead and passing what we've got, and then looking at um, you know, looking at a tag system, it seems, if I understand correctly, there's a 2% difference between the proposal 
and the most restrictive regulation. Correct. Right? So I don't think we'll, in, in my opinion, and correct me if, if, if you think I'm wrong, I don't think we'll be doing a whole lot of harm to the resource by allowing the regulation as proposed to go through tomorrow. Especially if we were to, to add on a tag, if I get the clear direction that we want to seek permission to publish a tag in the associated fee in March, and that we could adopt that in May, yeah, your window of, of, of five or a, a oversized fish there would be, would be, be really short. narrow. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Excuse me. I want to follow up on that question, uh, Robin Rikers, Director of Coastal Fisheries. So one of the things that we do have to, if, if you do want to direct us to do the tagging system starting in September, we really, for our IT purposes and our Gordon Darby licensing system, uh, we definitely do need that direction um, either today or tomorrow so that we can start putting in places the things that we need to do for that to, to take place by September 1. So I, I would urge you, if that's what you would like us to do, to, to be, you know, be clear about that so that we can uh, go forward with that. And also, as Dacus has mentioned, based on some um, of the legal requirements, we, we have to have another publication to execute that uh, in the Texas Register. So we. To, to execute it the way it's been talked about, we will have to do that. Chairman, if I could have um, James Murphy step in and just kind of explain a little bit more of the leap. Yeah, for the record, James Murphy, General Counsel of the Department. Um, what we'd be looking at here, as, as Dacus and, and Robin said, is a permission to publish for a March um, consideration of adoption of a rule. Essentially, that would replace the current one oversized fish in the daily bag with this new tagging system. Um, that would mean we'd send out a Texas Register notice with that proposal that we would develop here over the next couple weeks that Dacus said we've already been talking internally about. That would then <clears throat> go to the Register with 30 days public comment for the March meeting. Um, that would then most likely become effective, excuse me, as soon as sometime in May. Um, we do have a 20-day waiting period before a proposed rule becomes effective after filing with the Secretary of State, and we do have to respond to the you know, nearly uh, significant public comment that we've received, and that does take some staff time. So yeah, we'd be looking at the possibility of having that um, in effect as soon as May, but as you've heard, we're looking at you know, getting that tag system up more in the mid-August time frame, and so there would be a period of time, Commissioner Abel, where we would be still transitioning with the one um, oversized fish in the daily bag until we have that replacement in place um, for the new license year. Commissioner Doggett. Yeah, Commissioner Doggett. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Gaislin, earlier you said that uh, during the freeze we lost 160,000. Yes, sir. That's right. a February okay. 20, 2021 freeze. Uh, okay. And and so I'm trying to put all the, the percentages in perspective here in our limits. So what, what percentage is that of the population? You know, and great question. I will say that we don't we don't count every fish. What we look at is relative abundance within our catch rates. But well, you I can't didn't, you tell didn't you, count all the freezes, right? So you, you that's most a, definitely. A, yeah, it, yeah. It paled in comparison to the eighty three and eighty nine freezes, but I can tell you on a on a low year, our landings through our creel surveys, and those are fish that are brought across the dock that we we count, and then they're expanded. On a low year, we see about 300,000 trout harvested. On a, on a very high year, which is way back in that time frame, we've seen up to close to a million, 900,000 trout harvested. That's harvested. Correct. So what do, you, what do you feel the population is? Is there some science on that that gives you the number? I'd hate to, I'd hate to wager a guess. Much, much larger than that. We know folks practice catch and release, and the population also comprises all those fish that are outside of those harvest regulations as well. Well, I mean, if you harvest 300,000, I mean, there got to be millions of fish, right? I would say that's a safe bet, yeah, at but... least. Okay. I'll say this, after the freeze, we stocked alone, that, that year 2021, we stocked 10 million, 10 million spotted sea trout. Now, all those won't grow and recruit into the fishery, but that's the effort of our enhancement program to kind of supplement and enhance that population. And that's our goal within our hatchery program is to stock 10 million spotted sea trout along the coast. You think, you think having the science to estimate 
the population would be very, very useful to you, especially setting limits, uh, trying to rehabilitate. Uh, all of this action we're doing is to is to help the population. There's got to be some science that can tell you what the you know within a reasonable margin what the what the population is. That'd be very valuable, I think. I would agree. It's it's most definitely easier in some of the closed water systems, lakes, reservoirs, ponds. It's extremely difficult to do that along you know 360 miles of coast. Uh, within Texas, so we've been using that. We've been using those catch rates, uh, that catch per unit effort, since the early 70s to really kind of monitor our trends and those the relative abundance. And coupled with our creel surveys that really get at that question that how many fish are coming across the docks from our anglers harvesting from that resource. So you think since the harvest is a third of what it was before the freeze, that that possibly the, the population decreased by two-thirds? At some point prior to the freeze, the highest number we've seen is about 900,000 spotted sea trout being harvested. Right. In more recent times, it's been on that lower end, closer to 300,000. With the same number of fishermen? Fishermen has actually in, in, increased. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I... My comment here or question really is specifically related to introducing this tag concept to what's already been published and talked about and discussed. I'm going to offer, you know, call it my feedback from Port Aransas, Baffin Bay, Port Mansfield areas. What's out there currently, the three fish bag, which I think we're under <laughs> um, celebrating, is almost seems to me a unanimously uh, collaboratively, all in favor say aye, kind of deal. So, we're doing we're doing really good work there. We got a you know Parks and Wildlife's got a really good. We're wearing a white hat. The 15 to 20 uh, seems to be very uh, almost unanimously well received. Protecting the 20 to 25 in and of itself is is a big deal. I I feel like personally there's a shift of almost a like the inland fisheries catch and release, we're getting that mentality in the coastal area. And having the 125 with no tag, but just having the 125 for those trophy fishermen or the people that, that maybe once in a lifetime kind of catch it, seems to be a very good, very efficient. You know, Commissioner Bell's comment about the angler, uh, you know, is it, is it, is it, Add, I, I do think it adds a step to the to the angler to have a tag and monitor a tag and keep up with the tag. I I think we're literally opening a you know a kettle of fish here if we want to introduce this tag at this stage of the game. I think we've got a really good um, three fish bag, fifteen to twenty slot. We shouldn't make it any harder or more difficult or open ourselves up to be you know. A government agency trying to just regulate ourselves unnecessarily. So if we need a tag in the future, let's take it up in the future. That's really my two cents worth. I guess if I need to ask a question, do you have any problem with anything I said there, <laughs> Dacus? Well, I, I will. I agree with you that the, the most commonly shared piece of opposition is to the one oversized per day. We're hearing a lot of support for that tag. But we, to your point, Commissioner Patton, we are hearing that the three fish, three fish bag and that 15 to 20 inch slot, by and large, the majority of anglers are really supportive of that, those two components of the proposal. And I would just say that on the, what Commissioner Abel said, it doesn't move the needle big on biomass, but leaving the big fish in the water has to give people more opportunities to catch a big fish versus people who are out there every day keeping a 25 incher. You just the odds of the the one time guy going out there being able to catch the big fish is going to increase. While it may not increase the biomass in a huge amount, and I think logic has to tell you that. And, and we're doing it with redfish anyway. It's not once we get it implemented, it's 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 not overly complicated. Commissioner Abel. <coughs> To both points, is there a compromise somewhere 
to stay away from the tag system and allow a daily harvest of a large fish, say at 28 inches or something like that, that would sort of be a compromise in the middle. I think that's something we could certainly entertain. Anything's possible within that, within that regulatory structure to set that, set that oversized limit at any one of these. I mean, there's these so. Classes. I think I might have said that last time too. I mean, there's so few of those fish anyway. It seems like that gets you around having to come up with a whole tag system, even if it's at 30, because I mean, your odds of catching one every day are none. There's very few of those big fish. I mean, within our landings, less and even above 25, less than 1% of those fish landed, less than 1% are 25 inches and greater. When you start getting up into um, the 30-inch class, rather large trout, that's less than two one-hundredths of a percent that we see landed. We see landed. Now, a lot of folks that, and I will agree with Commissioner Patton, that a lot of folks that are catching those, we've seen a shift, and a lot of folks that are catching those, those bigger, well, I'll say trophy trout, they're practicing catch and release. So they're not coming across our docks. Okay, any other questions? Uh, I've got a couple. If, if I look at the 26% is totally opposed, the 35.5% actually is asking for more regulation than when we're, that what we're thinking about here today. So uh, we are, I, I think, being um, relatively soft on regulation as comparatively to that 35.5%. So that, that puts you at 72, 73% of the people want this. And to Commissioner Patton, 15 to 20, I don't think there's any... Um, there, there, there's not any conflict on that as well as the three bag limit. It gets to this 25 inch, 28 inch tag, no tag. What was the basis that the 25 inch was set on? That was probably before my time, but at some point you reach that, reach that size class where there's simply just not that many fish above that. You know, as I said, there's less than 1% of what we see landed above that 25 inch chairman. I'm guessing it was probably associated with the ability to harvest one of those really large, one of those really large trout, but also balancing that they're so few and far between out in the, out in the environment. On, on your slide 10, you, you talk about, I mean, there's essentially no difference in biomass uh, from really, I mean, all the way from 28 up to uh, you know, greater than 32, I mean, just slightly. But that's one fish per year. When you, when you do the math on, hypothetically, uh, with the no tag, that you could be taking a 28 to 30-inch trout on a daily basis, that would clearly affect your calculation on biomass. I would say it would affect it very minimally simply because, and you, you're going to get tired of me saying this, they're, they're just the unicorns of the base. There's so few of those fish out there. And they do comprise, you know, a, a large, th those large fish, when you do the tally, they do comprise, and I'll give you some numbers here, the 30-inch fish, greater than 30-inch fish, they comprise 3.4% of the spawning stock biomass, just simply because of their, their more mass associated mm -hmm. with those big fish. Uh, greater than 28, an 8.6 percent proportion of that spawning stock biomass. So the cumulative weight of all those sexually mature females, 8.6 percent of those are greater than greater than 28 inches. Okay. Um, all right. So what, what's the what's the limit on uh, red drum? 28. It's we've got a 20 to 28 inch. Uh, keeps and, and is there any benefit to the angler just on having symmetry as it relates to 28 28 absolutely I do believe there is as especially as we recruit new entrants into the sport I think there's value in that consistency having that from one you know that's one of our more commonly fished or targeted species is red drum and spotted sea trout um, I think there is value in having that consistency just for the sake of understanding and it I, 
point to our law enforcement, there's probably some ease in enforcement if you have some consistency across those highly sought after base species. And I know two different species, but, but similar patterns with red drum in terms of takes her down and I would say that yes, yes. Catches, everything since COVID, catches have been um, decreased, but our red drum, our red drum aren't nearly as susceptible to these freeze events that our spotted sea trout are. Okay, so I don't know uh, if there's support for this or if we could do it, but if we said three fish limit, 28 inch greater than uh, and one per day, and then ultimately maybe going to a tag limit. I, I, I take Commissioner Patton's perspective, well, less, less regulation is better in the world. Um, the path forward, if, if we implemented 3 and 28, no tag, can we have another discussion around the tag prior to actual implementation of it? Um, Chairman, yes. So to, to clarify in this proposal, um, we have, you know, reviewed the possibility of moving from 25 to 28 or to 30, and we do think that that's a logical outgrowth of the proposal that's before you tomorrow for a vote. So if you instructed staff today to change that to a 28 or 30 for that daily bag oversized fish, we can accomplish that in, in this proposal. Um, if you would like to explore uh, the tagging system, we do not feel that that's a logical outgrowth of what we have proposed. There's a fee component to it. It opens up other sections, and we would need to do a new economic analysis of the impacts of the rule when you create that tag. And so you have a couple options there. Um, one would be if you wanted significant discussion, um, you'd be looking at a permission to publish item in, in March where we have the opportunity to really talk through how you would like to proceed. That would mean an adoption in May, but as a practical matter, that's not going to be available for this next license year because of the administrative work that we described on the programming and all of that. Um, we would need to know sooner than later if we were going to tags to get that up and running for, for this next license year. Um, but certainly there's the opportunity for discussion in March during the work session on that you know, after we have submitted that for public comment. Um, if you would like to simply, you know, really consider it, get additional feedback and the rest, um, you could also explore that for the following license year, and we could include that in next year's proclamation um, and statewide preview that we start that process in November of next year. So if you're certain that you'd like to explore the tag, we can bring a proposal for adoption in March. If you would still like significant additional input and feedback and, you know, discussion, we'd probably just because of the programming and all that need to okay, wait for can the we, following could, year. Can we do both? Can we essentially be ready to go with the tag, do the, do the administrative work so we don't have to wait for another season, but then have more discussion around yes. it? Yes, okay, sir. so that's what I would like staff to do. So we're ready to go, and so we could implement a tag system by the next fishing season. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so I don't know if there's consensus, but what do we need to do in terms of if we want to modify the 25 to 28? Uh, you would just need to instruct DACUS here today that you would like to put that into the proposal that would be voted on tomorrow. Do we need a motion on that in a second? Um, no, sir. No. We, we would just need your direction as chairman as to whether or not to place that as modified. Certainly, if you would like to hold a straw vote right now on that topic, you are welcome to do so, um, and that's at your election, sir. Sure. Straw votes are good. All right. <laughs> who's, who's for 28 and greater? What do we got? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Uh, okay, majority rules. Uh, so let's. Can I, can I be on record that I'm happy, happy uh, with the way it's being published? 25. So I'm officially against 28. Okay. All right. If we're going to have a straw poll. I'd like to. <laughs> voice, voice in the dissenting, <laughs> the, the dissenting opinion. Okay. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Patton. Uh, all right, so let's proceed forward tomorrow. Implementation, 3, 15 to 20. Uh, one fish in the bag greater than 28. I'll have it ready. Do the work for 
28. So we're ready to go, but I do want to have more discussion around it before we do it. Yes, sir. And we would also ask if you'd like us to bring that in March that you formally uh, authorize permission to publish that here today and we can pr get that prepared and put it into the register for public comment. Great. Okay. Thanks very much. Appreciate have it. Have ready for you tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, work session 5, 2024, statewide hunting, migratory game bird proclamation, request permission to publish proposed changes in the Texas Register. Mr. Oldenberger and Mr. Korszekwa, please make your presentations. All right, good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Sean Oldenberger. I'm the Small Game Program Director in the Wildlife Division. There it works. Uh, today, um, myself and Mr. Blaise Korszekwa will be going in front of you to present proposed changes to the 24-25 Statewide Hunting and Migratory Game Bird Proclamations and seeking permission to publish in the Texas Register for public comment and potential action at the March Commission meeting. I'll start off with some good news. Uh, the Duck Stamp Modernization Act of 2023 was some federal legislation that was signed by President Biden on December 19th. Um, as you recall, in past discussions with digital licenses, it came up with some commissioners in the past as far as the federal duck stamp goes. Uh, here's mine that sits in my wallet since I have a digital license and signed, uh, so I'm valid to hunt waterfall. Um, and so what this does basically, since we're in an electronic duck stamp state and we're signed up with the Fish and Wildlife Service to do that, which about 30 states are, um, you're allowed to actually get a 45 day waiver where you don't have to have a physical hunting, physical stamp on you while you're waterfall hunting. And that comes later from the contractor, uh, that's Amplex actually out of Grand Prairie uh, for you in the mail. Um, so what the, this does is actually removes the requirement to actually have a physical duck stamp on you while waterfall hunting. Um, so you can just buy it and after 45 and you're good for the whole season. So thinking about digital licenses moving forward and, and probably the increase in those, uh, I think we sold about 100,000 this year. Um, basically going forward, hopefully in the 40, 24, 25 season, you'll not have to have a physical duck stamp on you while waterfall hunting. So that's a big move in the right direction for our constituents. Uh, we're waiting for the Fish and Wildlife Service to give us direction on the implementation of that for next hunting season. So moving on forward to... Uh, the proposals, I'll start with the Migratory Game Bird Proclamation for staff proposals. Uh, just wanted to be clear, too, uh, before we go into these, uh, both on the statewide hunting side for, for wild turkeys and also on the Migratory Game Birds, uh, we had unanimous, unanimous support from both the Migratory Game Bird and Upland Game Bird Advisory Committees uh, for all staff proposals. Uh, we do have a fair number of staff proposals, and the one I'll highlight before I go into them specifically is the last one here, uh, just a reminder for calendar progression for all other migratory game bird hunting seasons uh, that we're presenting here. Uh, we're, gonna out, we're gonna have two proposals that adjust some of the hunting seasons, uh, but obviously the date for like the third Saturday in November, that changes every year, so we have to do that calendar progression within the TAC on an annual basis. Um, so I'm just gonna call out the, the changes for hunting seasons uh, that we're proposing. Otherwise, all would remain very similar to this last hunting season. Uh, we'll start with the light goose conservation order. Uh, we have previously gone in front of you to kind of give a status update on light goose populations in the mid-continent region, which is both the uh, <laughs> Mississippi and the central flyway. Obviously, we're at the end of the flyway here in Texas, and traditionally we had a large number of wintering uh, light geese on the Gulf Coast of Texas. Uh, this has declined substantially. Uh, we'll go into that in the next slide. Uh, but when we look overall at the mid-continent population, uh, there was introduction of a conservation order in 1999. Uh, that was introduced by Congress and the Fish and Wildlife Service to actually uh, decrease adult annual survival on snow geese, uh, and that was the hopes you could actually decline the population by using hunters as a management tool. Uh, so it's not an intended hunting season. It is primarily a management tool to try to, try to decrease the population. Um, you can see here as the conservation order was introduced in 1999, we did have some steady growth on adult geese, uh, but then starting there, in the mid-2010 or so, uh, it started to decline rapidly. Uh, 12 of the last 15 breeding seasons have had fairly poor gosling survival on the breeding grounds uh, due to various conditions up there. And so that's why we've actually seen this population decline at a mid-continent level, uh, not, as, um, not because of the hunting or the conservation order, I should say. Uh, when we look at Texas specifically, uh, Texas invented snow goose hunting. Uh, we did with Texas regs and other things. There's been a lot of folks. Uh, if you look at uh, roost ponds in Texas, uh, uh, those started in Texas here. Uh, so a lot of the good things that have been done for waterfall over the years started here in Texas. Uh, you can see here, uh, basically going back to the late 70s and early 80s, we had a large population of wintering geese 
on, on the Gulf Coast. Unfortunately, due to a number of changes that have happened over time uh, since the introduction of the Conservation Order in 1999, we've seen a significant decline in wintering light geese here in Texas. Uh, there's a lot, this is not cause and effect, so I'm not trying to say that. There's been a lot of large-scale changes across the flyway. Uh, reduced agriculture here in Texas uh, would be one with rice, uh, flood up, water availability, but also changing reservoirs north of us, changing agriculture north of us, uh, where we had cow-calf operations in South Dakota and North Dakota. There's cornfields now, uh, and so obviously those are a lot more food availability north of us and a lot more water of it north of us than there historically had been. So there's a lot of things going on. But what's important for us is, is the geese that we do have winter here in Texas and doing the right things for them. Um, so after a fair number of discussions, uh, we did, um, and I should note here to the conservation order as well, and as the introduction occurred in 1999, we did have a significant number of folks here uh, did participate in Texas, uh, well over 100,000 people, and we did harvest a lot of geese. Uh, but what has happened since the introduction of the light goose conservation order, we have steadily seen a decline uh, and it's plateaued about the last 10 or 15 years or so and had a significant decrease in participation and also harvest uh, during the conservation order, which is after the regular season. Uh, so we did um, have some scoping sessions back uh, in November, both in Richmond and El Campo. Uh, we did have approximately 50 or 60 folks attend those. Uh, we do have some regulatory options we wanted to get public comment on with regards to the conservation order and the regular hunting season and all regulations regarding uh, light geese in Texas. And so we presented five things in front of the participants of those um, scoping sessions. Basically, we said um, there's things that we're looking at as status quo and known changes, so just keep the season's dates and, and for conservation order and regular season we currently have. Uh, eliminate the conservation uh, and stop at the end of Last Sunday in January, uh, some of you are very familiar, that's also the ending of duck season traditionally uh, in the south zone here in Texas. Uh, to eliminate the conservation order and extend the regular season uh, underneath the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, we can have 107 days of opportunity on any species. Uh, so we'd extend that season uh, beyond what we normally do. And then two segments which introduce a rest period. And then also reduce daily peg limit from 10 to 5. As we look at the results, uh, we did get 38 total respondents from those two scoping sessions. Uh, it's a little unclear here with agree, neutral, and disagree. I would like to highlight the yellow. Um, we saw a fair amount of disagreement with the ending the conservation order in the last Sunday in January. We did see some agreement on reducing daily bag limit from 10 to 5 from those participants that did respond during the scoping sessions. So uh, basically, staff have talked about this. We went to our technical committees, advisory committees, and with the scoping sessions. Uh, we believe the best thing for geese in Texas, or at least light geese, is to go back to where our hunting seasons were prior to the conservation order, and that would be eliminating the light goose conservation order, reducing the daily bag limit of light geese from 10 to 5, standardizing possession limits uh, from for light geese from three times the daily bag limit like all the other migratory game birds, and then also take that regular season and extend that 19 days to get the maximum number of days of opportunity during the regular season with those regulations. All right, moving on, uh, greater white-fronted geese. Um, as you are probably aware, uh, migratory game birds are managed cooperatively uh, between nations, uh, Canada, Mexico, and the United States, but also between flyways and agencies, and that includes uh, basically the you know, Canadian Wildlife Service, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, and then also the flyways, including the Central Flyway Council that Texas sits on. Um, we did do a rewrite of the Greater white fronted Goose Management Plan for the Mid-Continent Population uh, this last March, and that was agreed upon by all the signatories. And basically what that did is it showed that uh, it was based on some new research. And in fact, Texas did here uh, with um, some other cooperators at USGS and Texas A&M Kingsville, uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service. And so we actually radio marked a bunch of white fronts across Texas. Uh, There's this dogmatic thought that in the Winchester Lakes area that those birds come from interior Alaska. We went and put a bunch of bird uh, radio tags on them and they went all over the Arctic. Um, so there just seems to be no specific breeding colony that those geese come from, and that was why we've had restrictions in the western zone for a number of years. So what the, the new management plan does, it allows us to eliminate the restriction on white-fronted geese there in the western zone, you see there uh, in white. And so basically what we just do is go from dark goose aggregate daily bag limit of five, and then just remove that restriction uh, of two white-fronted geese. We would have to maintain uh, that restriction in the eastern zone based on the management plan and federal frameworks. Moving on 
to Mexican ducks. Um, here's a picture of Mexican ducks in West Texas. Um, a little background on this, and I went in this in November, the American Ornithological Union in 2020 recognized Mexican ducks as a species. Uh, and then after the fact, in 2023, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service added them to the 1013 list. Uh, that is the official list of birds that are protected underneath the Migratory Bird Treaty Act by the Department of Interior. And so they were added to that. Uh, so they're, they're coming into play into federal frameworks now. Um, so basically right now we have a definition of dusky ducks in our regulations to protect model ducks. Um, so you know that there's five days there during the regular season you can't harvest a dusky duck. Um, and so we just be simply replacing Mexican-like uh, with Mexican duck uh, to conform with federal regulations. Moving on to dove seasons uh, and some slight changes here. Uh, special white-winged dove area, as you can see there in south, uh, we obviously have a long history of white-winged dove hunting in Texas, uh, pretty much for the primary state that does have this in the United States. Um, and so you can look this last year during the special white-winged dove days, uh, we had a very clean calendar this last season, we had a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Well, thanks to calendar progression and a leap year this year, it gets a little bit crazy with what the September calendar looks like. Uh, we are allowed six days underneath federal frameworks prior to the regular season that opens on September 14th. And so uh, staff are recommending September 1st, 2nd, and the 2nd being Labor Day, and then the 6th, 7th, 8th, the following weekend, three-day weekend there, and then the 13th to maximize the six days before the regular season opens on the 14th. Another slight modification for dove seasons is a staff proposal for the North Zone. Um, we had some public comment on this that they wanted some more days around when uh, basically uh, schools were closed for folks being out. The North Zone is a very large geographical area with lots of different weather and lots of different conditions. Uh, and basically they wanted to remove a week prior to the second segment and put that on the back end. As you can see there, we get some January days now. And we didn't see a biological reason to do this uh, for that hunting opportunity. Uh, so staff are proposing this slight change to the North Zone. All right, moving on to statewide hunting proclamation proposed changes. Uh, we do have a number of wild turkey proposals in front of you. Um, we'll start with the first one. Um, staff are proposing mandatory reporting for wild turkeys. And the reason we're doing this currently is uh, we do have a small game harvest survey that does estimate the number of turkeys taken by hunters in Texas. Unfortunately, the timing of that and when it occurs, we don't get the results until 18 months after the spring season. In addition, um, those on a county level basis are not precise or accurate estimates. Uh, we've seen our response rates on our harvest surveys, like all surveys that are done, no matter what, uh, decline rapidly uh, in the new electronic age. Uh, well, I think this last year we had about 15% response rate on our small game harvest survey, which is actually good compared to some previous years. Um, and so. A lot of our harvest surveys are pushing 10% response rates now, where historically they used to be 40, 50, 60%. Um, so we have a lot of uncertainty with our harvest estimates, and we do not get accurate or precise estimates on county levels. Um, 32 of the 49 states that do have turkey seasons right now do have mandatory reporting for wild turkeys. And what I mean by mandatory reporting is only successful hunters need to report their take. Um, some states do have where both unsuccessful and successful hunters need to report take. Uh, you can see here uh, approximately 2,800 um, reports of wild turkeys came in through our My Texas Hunt Harvest this last year. Uh, you can see there in the counties outlined in black, those are our mandatory reporting counties that we currently have. Uh, those are the eastern uh, Texas counties where we have eastern subspecies. And then the one gobbler area uh, down there you see outlined as well, where we have some limited populations in isolated habitats. Uh, but these are the 2,775 20, reports we got. Uh, those are through the digital license, voluntary, or through mandatory reporting uh, in county regulations. Uh, a lot of states do this. You can see here, here's Missouri Department of Conservation. Here's an example. They update this three to four times per day during the spring season so people can follow how turkey season's going in Missouri on their website. Uh, you can see here, they get these neat little maps. Uh, we're not recommending to update a map online three or four times per day, but we would have real-time information to see how turkey harvest is going in the state, plus we would have updated information and precise harvest estimates and being able to manage the species uh, across the state of Texas. I'll move on from mandatory reporting to a proposal to close wild turkey hunting south of Highway 82 in Fannin, Lamar, Red River, and Bowie counties. Uh, you can see there, as uh, highlighted, the red dashes, the proposed closure area. You can also see there in green, uh, that's where we've had eastern wild turkey stockings. 
as we've all we've been trying to do eastern turkey restoration in east texas for a long time uh, but we've really had a really concerted effort here in the last eight or nine years uh, we actually received turkeys from out of state uh, last year we received a number of turkeys from maine uh, this year we're hopeful to receive some turkeys from rhode island uh, they have some problem turkeys we're happy to take them um, and so uh, we ship those and fly those here and release these on these sites that these landowners uh, private landowners actually put in proposals to us to how allow these restoration sites occur in their areas. They have to have uh, basically meet a bar with a habitat suitability index. They also have to do uh, habitat management on their properties to make sure that these releases are successful. Um, you can see here 2018 wild turkey reported harvest. Not a lot of harvest in those areas, but as we've expanded, and those are in green, uh, where the mandatory reporting locations occur in those counties, but as you can see, as we've expanded our restoration in East Texas to some of those habitats that could be, we could have sustainable populations. We start seeing more of those green dots show in that closure area. It's not our intent as an agency to put, put and take for these, this restoration effort. Uh, so staff are recommending to close this area to Eastern wild turkeys in an effort to restore these populations, which down the road, maybe we'll be able to have hunting seasons for this population. Uh, moving on, uh, we do have a proposal to close Milam County and Bell and Williamson counties east of I-35 to wild turkey hunting. Uh, you can see there in gray on this map, that's Granger Lake Wildlife Management Area, also managed by the Army Corps of Engineers. And they did come to us a number of years ago and ask for the release of Rio Grande turkeys on Granger Lake area. Um, if you know this area, um, there's fairly minimal habitat, but there is some good habitat around Granger Lake. Uh, we also have some riparian areas that do hold some birds in this area. We held a scoping session last fall uh, with all the private landowners and neighbors and Army Corps of Engineers um, in the area. We had approximately 50 or 60 people show up to this. It was almost consensus to close these counties and allow this restoration to occur. We'd be moving Rio Grande's, trapping those in South Texas or Edwards Plateau's areas and moving these birds to this area in hope of uh, basically increasing the population in this area. And then after five years, we would take a look at it about opening this back up to hunting seasons. Um, we also have some regulations related to changing wild turkey season structures in a few areas where we do have limited populations of wild turkeys. Uh, anybody that's driven from uh, on I-35 has seen this tremendous growth down the, the corridor lately. Um, so staff are proposing in Hill, McLennan, uh, and basically Travis, Hayes, Comel, and Guadalupe counties, those areas east of I-35 um, to bring those into the one gobbler zone, which are in pink. Uh, and so that would be an April only season with one gobbler allowed uh, per county for harvest during the season. Uh, we believe this is more commensurate with what the population size is in this area. We're starting to get very isolated populations due to the development in this area. And therefore we wanna protect the birds that we do have in this area for the long term. Uh, similar, uh, we do have isolated populations in the Trans-Pecos, especially west of the Pecos River. Uh, and we have those counties there hash lined out and Jeff Davis, Pecos, Terrell and Brewster. Uh, we would like to a uh, staffer proposing to actually switch the regulations here from north zone which they currently are in to once again to that one gobbler spring only season uh, to actually be able to track these populations and be commensurate to what status is in these counties uh, obviously once you go across the pecos river and go north of that we do have very abundant rio grande turkeys but in this area uh, we don't in select areas we do but it's very limited uh, and then in addition to this um, dependent on what the commission does with mandatory reporting, um, if that doesn't go through statewide, we like the one gobbler areas, uh, if they would be, uh, basically if they would be adopted in March for those areas to also be mandatory reporting if the statewide is not adopted. Um, one thing too, we would also like to do is remove subspecies from regulations. We do get a lot of confusion on subspecies in our regulations, the way they're written, especially from new hunters. Uh, is this an eastern bird? Is this a Rio Grande bird? Um, what am I looking at? And so you here see these three gentlemen uh, that hunted here in North Texas uh, this last spring and harvested three birds on this property. They look very different. Uh, there could be some confusion what these birds are. They all are Rio Grande subspecies, but we get a lot of variation in Rio Grandes. Uh, and so we just want to remove that subspecies and just manage at a geographical level. Uh, that'll just decrease confusion, especially for new turkey hunters, where they're asking along the I-35 corridor, is this an Eastern, is this a Rio Grande? Uh, what are my regulations? It just would make it a lot more simpler from a, from a R3 standpoint. Uh, with all this, uh, we, this is what the fall turkey hunting seasons currently look like. Uh, they're in yellow, you can see the North Zone Fall Zone in orange, South Fall Zone, and then you have the Sand Sheet uh, regulations down there. Uh, proposal would look like this. So there's some slight changes, but, but not a whole lot. 
Uh, and then we look at the spring turkey hunting right, seasons here is what it currently looks like. Uh, once purple is that east zone, uh, that one gobbler area there in blue, north and yellow, and then orange is south. And if adopted, the new map would look like this, where we do have some uh, restrictions in those blue areas are added, and then some deletion from the purple area from those closure areas. I know I covered a lot of material in a very short time, so I'd be happy to take any questions before I turn it over to Blaze. Patton. Um, I've kind of got two, two, but the first one will go to uh, slide 18 on the special white wing dove day proposed calendar. Um, on the, notwithstanding it is Friday the 13th <laughs> that um, gives me pause, but would the regular south zone open on Saturday the 14th. Is that why that's gray? Yes, the, correct. The regular season's in gray. I'm sorry if I didn't uh, uh, get to that too well and explain it. But yes, the yellow would be special white wing dove days and then the gray would be regular seasons. So yeah. that, so effectively, we're, depending on how you want to look at it, we're kind of opening that south zone maybe a day early for white wing dove. Is that kind of the net effect of well, the, the way we look at people, we do get a lot of people in the south zone travel for that purpose. And so folks that could travel, and, and once again, the special white wing doves are an afternoon only season, where when you get to the gray in the regular season, that opens you know, much earlier, right? So you can actually do morning hunts on that. So it wouldn't be technically earlier, it would just be taking advantage of the six days we have for that special white wing dove days. Okay. Um, that's great then. Um, I don't know the recall the slide, but it, I think it was your final turkey map um, that I I don't have it up on mine. But keep going, keep going. Okay, that one. Yep. I guess I was yeah. I was looking at the South Texas South Zone Brown, and it looks like your your line to the southwest you're catching. A corner of Valverde, uh, irregular southern boundary of Kinney, and but you see what I'm talking about. You yep. you, you drew a line. Oh, is that Highway 90? That's Highway okay, 90. Yep, yep, yep. Right. That's yep. all I have. Yep. Thank you. you. Edwards Plateau to that brush country. Yep. Any other questions before I turn it over to Blaze? Uh, I've got two. One, um, well done on the federal duck stamp. I assume you still have to sign it. Uh, yeah, currently you do have to sign it, um, but hopefully uh, moving forward, if the Fish and Wildlife Service gets some guidance on that next year, uh, when you get your license, whether it be digital or in paper form, and it says electronic duck stamp on there, you're good for the whole season. And so you will so not have we'll to have actually that. specify it on, on your state yeah. license. Yep. So, so we're an electronic duck hmm. stamp state, so it, it specifies it on your license. And so there, from a game warden standpoint, you would be good the whole season. You would not have to have a physical physical duck stamp on you for that the, for is a real game changer yeah. so well done whoever put that together and then back to slide 18 why would you not if you've got six days of white wing why wouldn't you not give hunters the full weekend back one more why wouldn't you give them uh august what 31st 30th why wouldn't you give them saturday sunday monday it just it's, yeah, it's actually a great question, and I didn't explain that. So underneath the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, hunting seasons can only start September 1st by law. I see. Okay. No, no other question. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. Just for the record, my name is Blaze Korzekwa, White Tail Deer Program Leader, and this morning I will be requesting permission to publish the proposed changes to the statewide big game hunting regulations. But before I begin, there's one change to the agenda items you may have in front of you. I just want to point out that staff will not be proposing to expand the general deer season two weeks in the north zone. The first proposal is to adjust the desert bighorn sheep season. Currently, the season runs from September 1st through July 31st. The season has been closed when department staff conduct bighorn sheep surveys. 
Historically, these surveys were conducted in August. However, after review of our Bighorn Sheep survey protocol, the survey period has been changed to October 1st through November 14th to allow for cooler temperatures and safer flying conditions. And due to this change, staff are proposing that bighorn sheep season be changed to November 15th through September 30th to avoid hunting during this survey period. Staff are also proposing changes to terminology used when referring to pronghorn. These changes would remove references to pronghorn antelope and antelope and simply replace with pronghorn because pronghorn are not in fact a true antelope. This change would also help simplify the regulation uh, language. The next proposal is in regard to the expansion of doe days. Although doe harvest is permitted throughout much of the state for the entire duration of the general season, there's currently 89 counties that have some form of doe days. Th these counties with doe days have restricted season dates in which does may be harvested with a firearm, which allows for a conservative harvest, but still allows for hunting opportunity. The 43 counties shown in green on the map currently have a 16-day doe season and are located in the Oak, Prairie, and Piney Woods ecoregion. Staff are proposing that these 43 counties be expanded to a 23-day doe season. The state of Texas is divided into deer management units, which the department uses to estimate populations and to, and to recommend regulations. Those 43 counties represented in green on the map are comprised of deer management units 15 through 21 north. Based on the department's deer surveys and harvest records, these, ma these management units have seen an increase in deer density as well as a skewed sex ratio of 3.9 does per buck. And even with the current 16-day doe season that's in place, antlerless harvest is only about 45% of the total harvest. Staff have also received feedback from landowners and hunters that have voiced their concern with the increasing deer population. Many farmers on the western edge of these 43 counties have voiced concerns over crop depredation and financial losses. These hunters, landowners, and farmers have all requested an increase in doe days. This slide shows a calendar view of the current 16-day season as well as the proposed 23-day season during the, the past uh, month of November of 2023. The 16-day season occurs during the first 16 days of the general season. Hunters have provided feedback that this 16-day season does not incorporate Thanksgiving holiday, which is when many hunters have time to go afield. The proposed 23-day season would incorporate the Thanksgiving holiday and would run from the opening day of general season through the Sunday following Thanksgiving with the additional days uh, shown there in orange on the calendar. Although it's called a 23-day season, it's due to calendar progression and the week that Thanksgiving actually occurs on, some years may be slightly longer than 23 days, but overall it's, it's considered a 23-day season. The bag limit in these 43 counties will still remain at two antlerless deer all seasons combined. The next proposal is the modification of rules regarding the method of take of youth for youth harvest of branched antlered bucks on properties enrolled in the Managed Lands Deer Program Harvest Option. Under current regulations, during the first 35 days of the Managed Lands Deer Program Harvest Option season, bucks without at least one unbranched antler which can only be harvested with archery equipment. This applies to all hunters, including youth hunters. However, under current regulations, uh, these 35 days overlap with the early youth-only weekend in which youth hunters may use firearms to harvest any legal buck under county regulations. This overlap and difference in method of take has caused confusion among youth hunters. Under current regulations, even though it may be the early youth-only weekend, youth on properties that are enrolled in the MLDP harvest option still must use archery equipment to harvest branched antlered bucks. Staff are proposing that youth hunters on properties enrolled in the MLDP harvest option is be allowed to harvest any buck with a firearm on the same days that correspond to the early youth only weekend for county regulations. This calendar shows the month of October for, 23, for the 2023 season with the early youth weekend shown there in yellow. And because harvest option tags are regulated and issued by the department, there is no consequences of allowing youth on these properties to harvest bucks with a firearm on the same weekend that is allowed for all other properties. 
I will also note that the next proposal would add a day to the early youth only season, and that change would also be reflected on, on this proposal as well. And lastly, staff are proposing that the early youth seasons in the fall include Friday for white-tailed deer, squirrels, and wild turkey. This calendar below shows the current early youth only season for white-tailed deer during this past um, season of October of 2023, with the orange date representing the proposed addition of Friday. Based on the department's harvest and survey data, hunting pressure from youth hunters is low, and the addition of Friday would provide additional hunting opportunities, but have little to no impact on the population. Staff are requesting permission to publish the proposed changes in the Texas Register. That concludes, that concludes my presentation, and I'm willing to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Uh, questions or comments by the commission? Hearing none, uh, it is good to see that we're actually increasing bag limits versus decreasing bag limits. Thank so you. that's a good thing. Okay, all right, thank you very much for your presentation. All right, uh, work session item number six, chronic wasting disease detection, the response rules, containment surveillance zone boundaries, recommended adoption of proposed changes. Mr. Alan Kane, please make your presentation. Morning, Chairman, Commissioners. For the record, I'm Alan Kane, Big Game Program Director in the Wildlife Division, and this morning I'll be presenting proposed amendments uh, pertaining to the establishment of CBD zones in um, context of some recent detections this fall, new detections, and requesting permission to put those uh, agenda items on tomorrow's agenda for action. Uh, on August 21st of uh, this past year, a suspect CBD positive female white-tailed deer uh, was detected uh, mm -hmm. in a captive breeding facility as a result of anamortem testing. Uh, in response to this confirmation uh, of the positive deer on September 7th, the department mm -hmm. established a two-mile surveillance zone around the positive facility through emergency rule on September 29th. Uh, in that surveillance zone is shown in yellow. The proposed amendment would replace the emergency rule and the proposed zone will encompass about 90,000 acres and approximately 83 properties that are wholly or partially contained in surveillance zone and those properties are designated by that gray shading or those polygons out that uh, uh, on the map there this slide just provides a reference to the location of the new proposed zone on the left in relation to the current zone on the right that's been in place since 2020 Hunters in the proposed zone uh, will be able to utilize a drop box at the entrance of South Lano River State Park, which is denoted by that blue star. Um, they can drop off heads in the box, or they could take uh, deer to the man check station in the other zone uh, at uh, Segovia there, uh, denoted by the red star. Next staff are proposing a new zone in Medina County in response to the confirmation of a CBD positive 14 month old white tailed deer in a captive breeding facility. This initial detection was a result of anamortem uh, testing in October of 23 and subsequently uh, confirmed by postmortem tests. The proposed two mile surveillance zone is denoted again in yellow, encompasses about 21,000 acres and 110,000 properties. Uh, again, those areas in the gray there would be affected. Uh, like Kimmel County, there's another zone close by, and this uh, map just provides a reference to the proposed zone in location. It's in the lower right there uh, compared to the current zone in Medina County in the, on the left-hand slide there that's denoted by the red containment zone and yellow surveillance zone. And so hunters in this proposed zone will be able to take deer to the check station in Hondo. It's a manned check station. We also have a drop box there to, to service those um, hunters as they need to get things sampled and it's denoted by the red star on the map. Next staff are proposing a new zone in Cherokee County in response to a confirmation of a CBD positive 52-month-old 52, 52 white-tailed deer detected in a captive breeding facility there. Um, the proposed two-mile surveillance zone, again, is shown in yellow, um, encompasses about 13,000 acres and 463 properties, um, those areas denoted in gray. A drop box will be available um, at the little town of Gallatin, just in that south uh, 
east part of the zone there uh, for hunters to drop off heads and we'll have um, you know we would have uh, seasonals on call to address um, hunter needs to in that particular area and then lastly staff are proposing to establish a containment zone and surveillance zone in Coleman County in response to a CBD positive detection in a free-ranging two and a half year old hunter harvested uh, buck the deer was harvested in November the department received confirmation of that positive in early December the proposed five mile di diameter containment zone surrounds the location of where that positive deer was um, located and the surveillance zone is shown in the yellow area and surrounds that containment zone. The area of um, the combined area of both zones encompasses about 150,000 acres and uh, more than 200 properties would be included within the boundaries of that zone. So at the time this proposal was sent to the Texas Register, um, the department intended to propose a new CVD zone in Kerr County pending confirmation of a suspect positive 14-month-old whitetail deer detected in the Kerr Wildlife Management Area deer research pens. The department was notified of a suspect detection on November 16th. The detection was a result of anamortem testing that was being conducted on all the captive deer in that facility as part of an ongoing research project. Out of an abundance of caution, staff euthanized all deer in the research facility, including the suspect positive deer on November 20th. Samples from all those deer were delivered to the Texas Veterinary Medical Diagnostic Lab at College Station on November 21st. Um, that resulted in uh, no additional detections. Um, and a press release was also sent out on December 1st that notified the public that uh, the deer in the facility had been euthanized. So tissues collected from that suspect positive deer, which included the entire brain, lymph node, obex, tonsil, and rectal tissues, were then sent to the National Veterinary uh, Lab in Ames, Iowa, for confirmation. Staff uh, received not detected results on all tissues from that positive deer from NVSL on January 4th. This is the first time TPWD has not received confirmation for CBD from NVSL in more than 600 positive samples following, or samples following a suspect positive IHC result, which is less than 1% or to be exact, it's 0.0016%, you know, that, um, so very, very low. This is the only time this has occurred. On January 5th, staff met with the Texas um, Veterinary Medical Diagnostic Lab as well as the Wisconsin lab since they're ones that originally um, confirmed the uh, anamortem IHC positive on January 8th and also later with, uh, or January 5th, and on January 8th, we also discussed the results with NVSL as well um, and what this means. Um, TPWD agency leadership was notified of the not detected test result on January 8th as well. Staff continued to work through gathering appropriate information and a data and announced NVSL's finding on January 19th. With the additional consideration, staff discussed with agency leadership removing the Kerr County proposed zone from the proposal because NVSL did not confirm the suspect positive deer in the research pens, noting that TPWD has never implemented a CBD zone based on a not detected result. As such, staff are recommending to the commission that the proposed zone in Kerr County be withdrawn for consideration because this suspect was not confirmed by NVSL. Although there has been much discussion uh, regarding the deer and the Kerr uh, Wildlife Management Area Deer Research Pens, staff con contemplated what is in the best interest for mitigating disease risk and the need to hold ourselves to our higher standards. The department opted to depopulate all deer in the research pens in November to eliminate the likelihood of amplifying that disease threat within the facility in addition to reducing disease risk uh, or transmitting the disease risk to the surrounding WMA properties or impacting neighboring landowners to the WMA. While staff do not recommend a zone in this situation, staff will continue to sample uh, hunter harvested deer on the wildlife management area 
and encourage voluntary sampling of hunter harvested deer on the surrounding properties as well as encourage proper carcass disposal practices. So as of last Friday, um, we'd only had five public comments, um, but over the weekend and into the day, we've had a flurry of comments, comments come in, so this slide is a little bit out of date. To date, we received 134 public comments um, on the TPWD webpage. Six percent agree with the proposed zone changes or zones, uh, new zones. Eighty-two percent disagree and 12 percent disagree with specific parts of the proposal. We did receive a letter of support from the Texas Wildlife Association um, for these proposals. Now, of the number of public comments received in opposition, the reason, well, let me back up here. Uh, the reason for uh, disagreement includes uh, things such as zones are disincented for landowners or hunters uh, as far as their cooperation goes. Uh, the removal of zones would incentivize hunters and landowners um, to allow statewide voluntary sampling because there's no repercussions. Statewide carcass disposals, um, you know, if that was added as a, a, an option down the road, it would negate the need for CBD zones. Zones have negative impacts on property values and hunting opportunities, and zones are not necessary because deer breeders are required to test 100% of their um, mortalities in the pen as well as 100% uh, testing of all live animal movements and uh, prior to live animal movements. Additionally, the department received two letters from the Deer Breeders Corporation and the Texas Deer Association in opposition to the proposed zones. The Texas Deer Association indicated that zones are punitive to landowners and hunters, negative, negatively impact real estate values. Zones are a disincentive for hunters and landowners um, in terms of testing. And TDA believes that CBD sampling uh, or CBD test requirements on deer breeders, including the recent adoption of the animal test requirements back in November um, for all live animal movements, as well as a consideration for a statewide carcass disposal rule would negate the need for zones. And then the Deer Breeders Corporation recommended the commission remove surveillance zones and only have containment zones on properties where CBD was detected. Um, they also provided some other suggestions that weren't necessarily germane to this proposal. So um, staff requests this item be placed on Thursday's agenda uh, for public comment and action, and I'll be happy to Thank you. Your All right. Any questions or comments by the uh, commission? Commissioner Abel, uh, I have a question on the discrepancy in the testing at the Kerr facility. So the National Lab, did they find that there were zero, no, no, protein prions present at all or just not in substantial enough amount to constitute CWD? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, for the record, John Solovsky, Wildlife Division Director. Um, so there was a difference in how the slides, the samples were interpreted from the various labs. Um, when Wisconsin and TVMDL looked at the slides. They described them as weak but convincing. I'm not quoting. I'm paraphrasing these conversations we had with the lab. And then when we submitted, when they submitted those uh, slides to MVSL for confirmation, um, MVSL again paraphrasing, not quoting. You know, described it that staining was present, but they didn't believe it was truly positive sample. And so to have a greater understanding of what that staining concept is, it's, it's I'll describe it simply as this, is the brighter red, the more color in that, t or in that slide, the more confident they are that the presence of prions is there. So when it's lighter or they describe it as present, you know, it's then a, somewhat of an interpretation of how, how much uh, prions may be present in that particular tissue sample. I guess one of my concerns is that I understand why we euthanize the herd you know, to mitigate any sort of risk to, to our facility and surrounding ranches. But I feel like we might have missed an opportunity to sort of see how the disease develops or it continues to, to gestate. And it would, if it would have gotten to a point where it would have tested positive at the national lab. Uh, good, good point, Commissioner Abel. And I think, you know, we still have opportunities to have, to further understanding of what's occurring on the Kerr facility as it relates to the presence of CWD and prions in that environment. 
Um, if you go back clear to January when we initiated, or when we were closing out that uh, research project that created this initial detection, we were uh, participating in a copper-zinc study to determine whether that would impact the ability for deer to not get CWD. And so part of that analysis was to evaluate various tissues. In this particular case, you know, they evaluated the lymph nodes in that deer that had that RT quick detection. So that then precipitated greater, you know, concern analysis from staff as well. And so we were concerned, well, okay, is it present there or not? So as we walked through all these steps of different testing and surveillance on the property for that particular deer in the previous January, we received no further detections from post-mortem, et cetera. But once we got the detection, uh, they had already initiated some environmental sampling that had the sentinels that you heard from uh, MinPro in the feed bunks did some soil sampling, they sampled the water uh, supply system and different things like that. And so we had these environmental detections that we were concerned about as well. And I think what's confounding about this whole process that we have not yet got a confirmation on either that deer previous January or this deer that was sampled in November is the fact that we are detecting prions in the environment at whatever level you wanna look at, the soil and the feed bunks, et cetera. So that leads us to believe that there has been some shedding has occurred on, on, the, on the WMA or within the research pen. And so the, the decision we made to, to remove those deer as expeditiously as possible was to prevent the additional accumulation of prions and just amplify the disease there on the, on the property. And so although that seems, you know, do we act too quickly, Knowing what we've known, as Alan described, about how many samples that we've successfully had confirmed with the lab, we had no reason to believe that this one wouldn't be confirmed either. And we certainly wanted to hold ourselves as an agency to a higher standard than maybe we'd even expect from some other people, recognizing that, you know, with this presumptive positive uh, determination on the curve, if we had a similar circumstance in a breeding facility here in Texas, we would not have requested, initiated any action like we took as an agency. We would have still waited for that confirmation. But again, you know, we have such, have had such great success with the lab and will continue to, I'm quite confident. But we were, you know, very positive what was occurring there and still stand behind the decision we made that to aggressively mitigate this disease so that it didn't, number one, spread further within the research facility, leak out into the WMA or onto the neighbors. Thank you. Anyone else? It's um, Commissioner Bell. It's, you know, we've got, it, it seems like we're, we're in, this, in this whole process, we still have all of this evolving information around CWD and best approaches. And also as a, as a research facility there, you know, one of my questions would be, if we find something like this, don't we also have an opportunity to look at how this progresses? Because we've got it, I mean, arguably, you, you can't con fully contain anything because you've got other creatures that can come into the area and leave the area and maybe spread prions, but it seems like we, might, we may have missed an opportunity to look at how the disease progresses, incubation times, things like that. And while that, it, it, it potentially lends to confusion or additional contested conversation over approaches. Um, your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I do have some comments on that, you know, and I, I tried to allude to this a little bit, you know, so we believe, you know, the testing that has been conducted, we believe there is some presence of prions in the environment. And that leads us to believe that there's some shedding that has occurred from one or more deer. Um, but as we evaluate that and we have an understanding of what we think occurred here, obviously a very early detection of CWD potentially has occurred on the, on the cur. But what's interesting is the current science, our current understanding is we believe it takes two, maybe three months of, you know, development of the disease within a deer before they do start shedding. And that may very well be what's occurred here. And like I said, we've done two rounds of environmental testing. We plan to do another round of environmental testing. But to, to further support our understanding of what has occurred or what didn't occur on the Kerr wildlife area is 
we have all those other tissue samples from those uh, deer that were removed, and we will do RT quick PMCA analysis, you know, and to try to have an understanding if, if number one, through those amplification methods, can we detect CWD in those other tried to have that understanding. Do we think maybe there was only one deer or maybe there were two deer? You know, we can, you know, I don't I would say argue, but, you know, very confident in, in the, the presumptive positive detection that Wisconsin and Texas, you know, veterinary medical diagnostic lab have support that. Like I said, different interpretation from NVSL, and they're really the gatekeeper on what's confirmed or not. So as we continue to evaluate, you know, all the tissue samples we have, another round of environmental sampling, we will learn more. And I think, you know, in November we talked quite a bit, you know, from the panel discussion about these experimental assays and what opportunities these can provide for us in the future. All of those opportunities are still in front of us. But what, you know, what we've learned from this and what we continue to learn is, is from those amplification methodologies, we will find it earlier, and you may not find it with the regulatory testing that we have available to us now. I'll probably get a little bit out of my lane here, but to talk about, you know, what we consider IHC, our gold standard on these tissue samples that we utilize now, it's not known for being real effective at finding early detections, and that's obviously what we think we have here on the curve. And have we, we haven't tested all the remainder of the, of the herd. Where are we on testing the, the balance of the herd that was euthanized? So all of the herd that was euthanized here in November, they've all received testing through the labs that we typically utilize, but we have not conducted the RT Quick and the PMCA of all the rest of those tissues. We have tissues saved that we're waiting to uh, collaborate with, you know, probably University of Texas and others to, to look at those samples and, and go through them and, and run both of those experimental assays on those samples we have. And you know, the, the other thing is a, a lot of times, you know, as we, as we learn things, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like that same, you know, the shark bite suit. There's only one way to test that, <laughs> right? Does, does this, does this, well, even if we want to call it a one-off, does this one-off cause us to want to look at our approach, um, adjust timelines for how we do things or any thought process like that? I think we always have to be adaptive and look, but we also have to work within the, the tools that we have in our toolbox. And right now those tools that we have are IHC, you know, confirmation through that, you know, those, those RT quick tools, you know, aren't in our toolbox as of yet, but, but we have shown as an agency, I think over years that we have been adaptive, you know, we've, we've moved from, from basically one plan where we have a detection of total depopulation to looking at research opportunities, looking at depopulation, looking at phase depopulation opportunities, you know, as well as other considerations such as, you know, USDA indemnity. So there are many more opportunities, I think, out there than, than what we've had even a few years ago. And so we continue to walk through that. And as I was contemplating, you know, last night, thinking about, you know, how we address some of these concerns, and that really the best thing I could come up with is that, you know, science, or maybe more appropriately, you know, research can be tough, because sometimes you're going to find out something you didn't expect, and then sometimes you're going to find out something you didn't want to know. And we kind of have a little bit of a blending of that right here, that, that maybe, um, you know, the discrepancy in how these slides were interpreted, you know, is something to learn from. But as we add all this other information that will become additive to our understanding, once we complete this additional analysis, I think we will be better positioned to manage other positive facilities, other detections into the future. And I, and I think people are, the, I think the, the public is going to be look, wanting to see how this experience informs us moving forward, right, in, in our activities. Because we just need to make sure that we're providing, I guess, the best options for folks all the way around, regardless of what they're regardless of where they serve in the stakeholder food chain. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with that more, so. Anything else? Um, well, Patton. Patton, not, my question, I guess I'm, my question is, would be moving on, so maybe not John, but I had it for Alan. Are, are we moving on from the curve? <laughs> it's all in one. Okay, so. all right. So I wanted to ask, not about curve, but maybe the 
general circumstances of the Coleman County CWD, like it seems to me unusual if we, there wasn't an existing uh, containment or surveillance zone there. Is that correct? That's correct. This so that proposed, yeah. and there was a hunter harvested two and a half year old male buck. Yeah. Um, did it exhibit signs? Um, I'm also curious. In in the past, when we had something like this, it, I felt like there might have even been an emergency order. It 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 seems like this is a little bit. A couple things about this seem like one off from what we normally do, but yeah. So. To back up, that was a hunter harvested deer. Um, it wasn't that we actually collected in the locker plant. Our staff are doing their normal uh, surveillance, so they out there at the locker plant asked the hunter, "Can I collect a sample?" And that's how we collect that. So we don't know. I'm assuming that deer wasn't clinical or or didn't exhibit disease signs. Um, it was just a normal sampling part of things. Um, and then. Second part of your question. I'm well, just, it, uh, it seems like in the past when you, we've had a free-ranging deer that, yeah. that the director will issue an emergency so, order. And then uh, the third thing in my mind on, on this proposed, it seems like we always have a proposed drop box station. Or, or if we do pass this, where are we going to – where do people take their deer? So both both good questions. So at the time we got the, the suspect positive um, – we were waiting for confirmation, and that took a while. That was into December um, before we got that. By that time, you know, having the logistics to actually stand up an emergency rule, have a zone location, to your point, a, a place where hunters can bring things, we couldn't have all that done by the time season was ending because they only had a couple more weeks for general season in the north zone. It ends about the 1st of January, so, you know, two or three more weeks of season. And so we... <coughs> suggested that we not use an emergency rule and just include it in this package, adopt it now, um, or consider it for adoption tomorrow. And then uh, it will be in place for next season. And that gives us time to determine where we need to put the check station, the drop box, and provide uh, locations to hunters. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman and Commissioner Patton, uh, just for your information, for the whole group's information, our staff did hold a public meeting in, in Coleman last Friday, had uh, I think 35, 36, 36 people in attendance to talk about you know, what this means for them, and we had really good feedback, very good participation from those folks that showed up. So, Okay, a um, couple of questions. Um, you know, it seems as though um, we probably shouldn't be depopulating deer until we have RT quick IHC and national wouldn't wouldn't you agree with that I mean why wouldn't we wait until we have all the data before we depopulate well you know the decision we made you know wildlife division as an agency as a whole were based on certainly our past experiences with the efficacy of the testing and what we experienced in the past and I think our efforts to hold ourselves to higher standard and to mitigate this disease risk as, risk as quickly as possible, you know, was to our benefit. The way the uh, the confirmation or lack thereof occurred with NVSL and that time period, uh, I don't have an explanation of why it was more protracted than what we're typically used to. I, I'm going to assume because of the confounding results they had and the difference of opinions and all the other samples they ended up running through. But nonetheless, you know, if we'd have waited you know, from the end of October or, or first part of November to January, you know, if in fact that disease was present, it would have continued to, you know, uh, in, have a greater presence on the research facility. And that was our concern primarily. So that's the decision we made. I'm not suggesting that going forward or even like I said, on a, on a breeding facility that we would ever suggest that somebody go in there and, and depopulate or make, take, that type of aggressive action just on a presumptive positive. Great. I mean, just, I mean, so I, I, I love the idea that we're holding ourselves to a higher standard. Uh, do, does, do you think the Kerr County uh, Management, Wildlife Management Facility, does it have CWD? There's prions presence in those RT quick samples, which leads us to believe something's occurring there, whether there's whether there's CWD or prions at a level that's infectious to other deer, that 
you know, I, I can't answer that. But, but if we believe in these experimental assays and, and the researchers that conducted that work, we have complete faith in them. We've talked to them multiple times. They stand behind their results just as much as Texas Veterinary Medical Laboratory and Wisconsin stood behind their results. So I have no reason to doubt their results. But as we've gone through this now for over a year, it continues to be, you know, a head scratcher for us. And when I think back to that initial detection that we had last January and the conversation with the immediate uh, management staff, the project leader, the one thing they were wanting to avoid throughout this whole process was to have a regulatory test confirmed for the WMA and the implications that potentially would have for us as an agency to have a positive facility for them to have a positive detection within their research facility and the implications to their neighbors. All of those things combined, we were very sensitive to that. And so... I understand, but we just have to deal with the facts as they are. I mean, right. if we have it, we have it. Uh, so are we doing further testing on those deer? Yes, sir. We will, we will run RT Quick PMCA, and we'll do another round of environmental sampling in those pens, et cetera, to determine, you know, are prions persisting, persisting in that environment? To, you know, there certainly shouldn't be any more because there's not any deer there, but how long that persistence is there, you know, what that means to our understanding of uh, cleaning and disinfection of other positive facilities, et cetera. There's just so much to learn. Right. That. And so pursuant to that testing, if we found lots of positive tests in deer, would that modify your perspective on whether there's a surveillance zone or not? Well, I think, I think we need to be cautious as an agency to create zones on experimental assays, you know, understand what that means. So I would be hesitant to make that recommendation to, you know, leadership. But, but if it was under IHC, which is a regulatory authorized test, Yep, I would be standing in front of you, or Alan, or one of us would be, we need to have a zone for Kerr County if we okay. had a confirmed test. Great, thank you very much on that. Um, and just, I'd just say in general, you know, we are playing defense, as we all know, uh, and, and I really am looking forward to hearing offense, you know, genomic testing, SS, SG, genotype, does that work? RT quick, can we find it quicker than waiting until the entire herd is, uh, is, is, has, has the, the prion? And so are we working on offensive-oriented strategies? Because if not, I mean, the entire state's going to be a surveillance zone at some point in time. You know, I think there's many people, including myself, that are optimistic about the genetic work that's ongoing. And I think, in my opinion, they've demonstrated that that genetic modifications, manipulations within those captive facilities can be successful and can, you know, create a more durable deer in captivity. Great. So I would just, I would just ask that we continue to try to play offense on this versus just do what everybody else is doing and create surveillance zones and just, uh, you know, ultimately eradicate deer hunting in the state of Texas. I mean, I, I know that's no one's desire. And so I just, I'm hopeful that we can do that um, and be a progressive, offensive-oriented agency. So, okay, uh, with that, uh, no further questions. I'll place the item on the Thursday commission meeting agenda for public comment and action. Thank you, guys. Uh, work session item number seven, Oyster Advisory Committee recommended adoption of proposed rule. Dr. Hopper, please make your presentation. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Dr. Yaskowitz. For the record, my name is Tiffany Hopper, and I am the Chief of the Science and Policy Resources Branch in the Coastal Fisheries Division. So you guys may recognize this slide from November. The Parks and Wildlife Code 11.0162 authorizes the commission chairman to appoint committees to advise the commission on issues under its jurisdiction. And Government Code Chapter 2110 requires that rules be adopted for each advisory committee. So this proposal would create a advisory committee for matters pertaining to all things oysters to assist in determining and executing appropriate strategies to maintain the long-term health of our oyster resources 
as well as the additional habitat and ecosystem services that they provide. This committee would be comprised of up to 24 members of the public, and the committee would expire on July the 1st of 2026 to align with the expiration date of all other TPWD advisory committees. So similar to some of my colleagues, uh, we've had a few additional comments come in since this slide was created. So as of 8 a.m. this morning, we've received a total of 30 comments. Of those, 24 or 80% were in support. Uh, those included comments from CCA Texas, the Texas Oyster Association, as well as support from the Coastal Resources Advisory Committee. We've had six comments or 20% of the comments were in opposition. And among those opposing comments, the most common reason stated for the opposition was a belief that this committee should either be entirely or primarily made up only of members of the commercial oyster industry. So at this time, staff is requesting this item be placed on Thursday's agenda for public comment and action. And I would be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hopper. Any questions? Okay. If there's no further questions, I'll place the item on the Thursday commission meeting agenda for public comment and action. I've got to go back. I apologize regarding item number four. Uh, I'd like to, uh, the work session item number four. I'd like to place this item on the Thursday commission meeting agenda for public comment and action. And as well on work session item number five, I'll authorize staff to publish the rules in the Texas register. My apologies there. Uh, work session item eight, Bell and Coryell County's Regional Habitat Conservation Plan Systems Advisory Committee and Biological Advisory Team, appointment of members and delegation, appointment authority to, to executive director, Mr. Evans. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Director uh, Yaskowitz. Uh, for the record, my name is Jonah Evans. I am the non-game and rare species program leader. Uh, this morning, I'm addressing a request from Bell and Coryell counties related to the development of a regional habitat conservation plan. A regional habitat conservation plan is defined in state code as a plan to protect endangered species in order to obtain a federal permit that requires acquisition or regulation of land not owned by the plan participant. Bell and Coryell counties are applying for a federal permit with U.S. Fish and Wildlife that meets the state's definition of a regional habitat conservation plan. This plan would provide counties with an umbrella permit that authorizes certain development activities and defines appropriate mitigation actions. Once issued, the counties would issue sub-permits to developers seeking to conduct covered activities in exchange for mitigation or other approved conservation measures. Parks and Wildlife Code Chapter uh, 83 requires TPWD's involvement in development of regional habitat conservation plans through two different committees, a Citizens Advisory Committee and a Biological Advisory Team. A Citizens Advisory Committee assists the local governmental entity in preparing the uh, habitat conservation plan. The committee is made up of citizens, landowners, partners, and at least one member appointed by the commission. Texas Parks and Wildlife Code directs the Texas Parks and Wildlife Commission to appoint, uh, to appoint this representative to the Citizens Advisory Committee. A biological advisory team must also be formed by the TPWD Commission, um, and they must appoint the presiding officer to this committee. The purpose of the biological advisory team is to assist the local governmental entity in calculating harm to species covered by the Habitat Conservation Plan and in determining the size and configuration of habitat preserves for those species. The applicants have requested that TPWD expediently appoint one member to the Citizens Advisory Committee and at least one member to the Biological <laughs> Advisory Team with subject matter expertise in one or more of the covered species um, or with expertise in development of habitat conservation plans. So staff is recommending that the commission appoint the following TPWD staff, uh, Colm Simpson to serve on the Citizens Advisory Committee. He is the TPWD wildlife biologist that covers Bell County. And Dr. Darren Prope to serve as the presiding officer of the biological advisory team. He is the leading expert on habitat conservation plans within the wildlife division. And finally, staff is requesting that the commission delegate future appointment um, authority for the Bell and Coriel 
uh, Regional Habitat Conservation Plan, two, the executive director to simplify and shorten the appointment process to seat committee members and avoid lengthy vacancy periods should one or more of the appointees need to be replaced for any reason. So in conclusion, uh, staff requests that this item be placed on Thursday's agenda for public comment and action. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Great, wonderful, thank you. Any questions? Uh, if there are none, I'll place this item on the Thursday commission meeting agenda for public comment. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Uh, work session item number nine, implementation of legislation during the 88th Texas Legislative Session, Senate Bill 922, relating to the establishment of a legislative leave pool for peace officers, recommended adoption of proposed rule. Mr. Sosa, please make your presentation. Morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. For the record, my name is Luis Sosa. I'm the Major at Headquarters for the Law Enforcement Division. Today, I'm here today to provide a summary and an opportunity to discuss item nine, which relates to the creation of a legislative leave pool department, nor require additional general revenue funding, nor do they increase or decrease full-time equivalent positions. However, the proposed rules do align administrative rules governing the department leave pools with provisions of Senate Bill 922. Regarding public comments, as of this morning, we have received three comments through the public comment portal. Of the three comments, one individual agrees completely and two disagree on a specific uh, being uh, item. Of the two individuals that disagree, one disagrees with our assessment regarding there not being a decrease in full-time equivalent positions. Their opinion is that a legislative leave pool will reduce our manpower out in the field due to officers being on leave handling legislative matters related to a law enforcement association. The second individual does not disagree with the proposed rules as drafted by staff, but with the language within Senate Bill 922. Their concern with the language of Senate Bill 922 is related to the minimum size a law enforcement association must be for its members to qualify for the use. Again, our goal today is to provide you with this summary and an opportunity to discuss. Staff request this item be placed on Thursday's agenda for public comment and action. Thank you for your consideration. At this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sosa. Uh, any questions? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions, I'll place the item on the Thursday commission meeting agenda for public comment and action. Work session item number 10, briefing, Mountain Lion update. Mr. Richard Heilbrun, please make your presentation. Good, good morning, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, for the record. My name is Richard Heilbrun, program director for the Wildlife Diversity Program. I'm simply here to introduce Mr. Joseph Fitzsimmons to you today, who chaired the Mountain Lion stakeholder group for the past year, and will give you a briefing on their report and their progress. He's also foreman, former chairman of the Parks and Wildlife Commission and is an active member of the conservation community and a landowner in South Texas. This was a large effort to undertake and we appreciate his service for the past year. So at this time, I'd like to bring up Mr. Fitzsimmons. Mr. Chairman, for the record, Joseph Fitzsimmons, and I'm pleased to be with you here today to report on the uh, Mountain Lion Stakeholder Group um, report, which I know you all have the complete report, the appendix, and uh, I would also uh, encourage you to look at the biographies of the 19 people who served on this group. Um, I really appreciate the leadership of the commission uh, former Chairman Applin, the rest of you have been setting this up as you're familiar uh, with the issue uh, stemming from a petition of 2022 for rule changes with regard to Texas mountain lions. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the staff. We had five meetings across the state and uh, they did an amazing job of pulling uh, the necessary resources together. We also have um, I happen to notice, I believe, five or six members uh, of the, of the um, uh, stakeholder group here today, including some of the petitioners. Uh, I noticed Donnie Drager, Ben Masters, Justin Dreblis from TWA, uh, Pam Hart, and Ronnie Swanson, two of the petitioners. And um, <clears throat> so we've, we've, we've had a great participation in this uh, process. Uh, goes without saying, there's some very strong opinions on the management 
um, of mountain lions in Texas. And so my first job was to keep everybody in the room and speaking to one another um, over the, the uh, little more than one year process and the five meetings. And I'm glad to say that um, although uh, all 19 don't agree on everything, um, I think they've, they've built some good relationships. They're all speaking to one another and uh, everything. Uh, it, 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 never, it never got, um, it was always spirited, um, but it, people were able to disagree without being disagreeable. And on that subject, um, one of the masters of that art, a member of our uh, task force, um, our, our group, Bill Applegate, uh, a trapper, uh, passed away uh, a few days ago. But um, you will see his, his comments in that, in that report. And uh, Bill spent a lifetime uh, with mountain lions as a professional hunter and trapper, and um, I'm, I'm sure you'll 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 be very clear what his opinions were when you read his his um, comments. Um, just to give you a little background, status quo, what we're beginning with in this job, the mountain lion management is unique in Texas, and it's unique because. We're the only state with a significant mountain lion population where the vast majority of the habitat is on private lands. You go through the western states, you, you look at the plans, and we did uh, through, through um, a number uh, of experts that, that came to see us, and uh, we are unique in that regard. And I think that's, that's paramount to keep in mind as you evaluate uh, your decisions. Um, harvest reporting is an important tool in measuring the health of a population. Uh, the experts were clear on that. Um, currently in Texas, there's no season or bag limits. Uh, there's no trap check requirements on mountain lions. Uh, however, commercial fur trappers are required to check traps every 36 hours. And um, I think it's worth pointing out that in the decades that we've been, been um, looking at the mountain lion issue in Texas, we really haven't taken advantage of the new technology uh, with regard to either survey or with uh, uh, trapping, um, uh, monitoring of traps. Um, currently, canned hunting of mountain lions is legal in Texas. Um, there are a number of milestones through these years. It's hard to believe we've been We've been kicking this can down the road for almost 50 years, and I'll confess that I gave the can a few kicks in my time. Um, but really, it, it, uh, um, it goes back that far. And there have been a number of petitions in addition to the 2022 petitions. And suffice to say that um, recommendations have been made, um, some studies have been conducted, but to date, we do not have a management plan uh, for mountain lions. And the reason for that is we don't have the data. So what, uh, and you can see, I won't read you all those uh, milestones, but as you can see, um, it, it's been evolving for some time. But there's been a lot more, um, well, there's been a lot more discussion than action. So what were the 2010 TPWD staff panel recommendations that came out of those uh, petitions in the 1990s? Um, really, none of them were enacted. Um, I, I, I assume that list of four uh, recommendations uh, to develop and implement a program to monitor population and status of mountain lions. Some research has been done, uh, but not enough if or when necessary, manage regional harvest, institute a 36-hour trap check, and prohibit the possession of, of, of live mountain lions. So <clears throat> none of that happened. So I think that's probably the beginning of, of Chairman Applin's charge to our, um, to our stakeholder group. And we had six very specific charges. Number one, uh, to um, advise uh, the staff and the commission on the abundance, status, distribution, 
and persistence of mountain lions in Texas. Number two, develop of development of a mountain lion management plan. Three, harvest reporting. Four, trap snare check standards, harvest bag limits, and canned hunts. In spite of very um, distinct opinions in this group, there's general consensus on four out of six. And for that, uh, I'm pretty proud. And I think that is because um, we spent most of our time learning what there was to learn about mountain lions. Um, I'll show you later the number of experts we had, but that really was the theme from the beginning. Uh, the group makeup, we had 19 uh, sh uh, stakeholders, uh, private landowners, land managers, trappers, houndsmen, livestock producers, academic researchers, uh, private wildlife biologists, and subject matter experts, including a number of the petitioners that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we focus on the foundation of science and expertise. We heard from, we had 21 presentations from experts from seven states. And I see Commissioner Gallo, who was your representative, and thank you for being at many of those meetings and your participation. Um, we really did bring in, thanks to our staff and connections of some of the people uh, on the group, we had the connections to really bring out the people who literally wrote the book on mountain lions and mountain lion management. Uh, one of them, originally from Texas, Ken Logan, who's done a lot of this, the, 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 the best research. The takeaway that I noticed from all of those presentations was that lions need a lot of range, fragmentation, is, is, a, is a major threat to successful lion management. I mean, Logan showed us some, some, some research on, 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 on Tom's uh, male mountain lions that traveled over 300 miles. Um, we know from our own experience working in, in West and South Texas just how far lions can travel. So fragmentation is a big issue. But <clears throat> The other point that was made is you've got to have the data. All these, these, these states, western states, um, with mountain lion uh, habitat and with um, whether it be game status or not, um, have data. And that's what we're missing. So in that period of time, we did a lot of, we, we did a lot of listening. So the frequent themes that were coming up was that every one of those 19 did desire a sustainable lion population. Significant concern about data and Texas being unique in our reliance on private land stewardship. The only way uh, any management plan will work will be uh, the cooperation and stewardship of private landowners and we'll talk in a minute about how we we, we leverage that to get the data we need. So charge number one was the abundance status distribution, persistence of mountain lions in Texas. Well, the consensus was pretty clear after we were educated by all these experts that we don't know. We have, we have some data, but um, we, we, as, as the, uh, uh, professional journals always say we need more research is needed, but our research we have some good research, but it's spotty, and it's in and we have uh, probably more in West Texas and South Texas, but there was a significant study, two significant studies done in South Texas, uh, one that brought up the issue of genetic diversity and the lack of genetic diversity possibly uh, in in South Texas, but it was also pointed out it was a small sample size. So um, there was general consensus in, in, in the entire group uh, on that point. Um, charge two was the development of a mountain lion management plan. Uh, again, it all comes back to the data. 
I was encouraged that people from both sides um, agreed that we need a management plan. What's amazing is that's been recommended to various commissions through the years, and it's never been done. And it's never been done because we don't have the data to support the plan, and I'll talk in a minute about some ways to, to, to solve that. Um, but what, what would a management plan uh, uh, entail? Uh, obviously, you identify the research and data needs, the methods of data collection. We'll talk about some of those in a minute. And with stakeholder involvement, i.e., with, with the uh, uh, landowners, uh, craft a milestone-driven process to guide, evaluate, and reassess uh, the, the uh, lion population and the department's actions. Uh, there was general agreement and support, um, as I said, of developing a plan and um, very importantly from the livestock and hunting community, uh, the plan should ensure landowner ability to manage depredating lions. Um, as you may or may not know, I mean, um, a, um, a number of, of landowners do have to deal with that, uh, especially in the sheep and goat industry, which is well represented uh, in our group. Charge number three is really um, two uh, uh, out of the six that where there was a real split. And that's the question of harvest reporting. All the experts that, that, that briefed us were clear that harvest reporting is critical for building a management plan. You've got to know age, sex, and if possible, have some DNA uh, material to really understand a population. Uh, so we, we, we lack that. We don't have mandatory reporting. So the real question came down to, do you have har uh, mandatory harvest reporting or voluntary? Well, the split was pretty clear in the agricultural, livestock, uh, some of the hunting community um, to stay with voluntary reporting. Uh, the scientific community was also equally clear that mandatory reporting uh, was much more uh, reliable than, than, than voluntary. Also, the petitioners were, were unanimous in their um, um, recommendation to follow um, the standard of mandatory reporting. The problem, as you see here, is that, <clears throat> as pointed out by the landowners, there was a, a risk of alienating private landowners with harvest reporting. And so obviously, if you're not getting the participation of the very people who are managing the lion habitat, you're, 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 you may be undermining those efforts by going to mandatory. So what really came out of this was that we might look at something a little different. You know, it's often um, mandatory versus voluntary. But as pointed out here, the um, lack of knowledge that we have now with voluntary reporting really is passive voluntary reporting. There's not really an active means reaching out to these landowners and people who are harvesting lions or getting pictures of lions to, to share that data. So th that was really sort of the breakdown. There was agreement that we need the data, but the current, and I call it passive voluntary reporting, is inadequate. So we started thinking about ideas of what I'll call active voluntary reporting. So <clears throat> You're familiar, familiar, and I heard you uh, uh, earlier in the presentation, the reference to the My Texas Hunt Harvest uh, app. We have great technology tools now. We didn't have the first time, this was all recommended 20, 30 years ago, where people can actively participate, either through their MLDP program, WMP program, the My Texas Hunt Harvest, that would greatly increase the amount of data uh, we, we would have. Now this, I'm, I'm going to sort of go off on this one a minute. We have the greatest opportunity with the millions of acres 
we have in MLDP and WMP and all those landowners, millions of acres, uh, my family's one of them, all in contact with a technical guidance biologist. And if those technical guidance biologists just on a voluntary basis say, hey, if you're seeing mountain lions, share the pictures. If, if your hunters kill a mountain lion, or if you have to trap one for depredation purposes, you know, share the data. And I, I really think that an active voluntary system could make a difference. Um, we've got, all, you know, a lot of technology that could help. So, um, as I say, charge three, there was a, a clear split uh, between recommending uh, voluntary versus mandatory. Um, charge four, another clear split. That was the, the other, the second one where there was not clear uh, consensus in the group. Um, there were a lot of concerns, you know, lions left to die in traps, bycatch of black bears, the negative images of trapping, spill over into other species. The people who opposed the trap check said, well, if you add the lions like you do the fur bearers, then where do you stop? And, you know, that, that, that was their point. And, of course, in what they considered an increased workload. So there was general agreement that the checking traps is important and ethical, um, but if they come required, electronic trap monitors should satisfy the requirement. And that, that's out there. That technology is there. Uh, so a very close split on whether to recommend uh, that change. Um, charge five, harvest and bag limits. This is interesting because this was in the original petition. And now there's general consensus in that group. We don't have the data to, to recommend harvest or bag limits. And as mentioned before, game status is up to the legislature. Um, charge six, clear consensus to prohibit, prohibit canned hunting of mountain lions. Uh, that can be done through the prohibition of the, the, the holding of a live uh, lion. Um, but for some reason, lions were accepted from an earlier statute regarding canned hunting uh, in the legislature. So with that, um, glad to entertain any questions from the commission. Patton, um, the stakeholder group, and I'd like to say that I thank you for what you've done. I've heard from several people on this, and you, you have succeeded in, uh, I think, walking that fine line of keeping both, both groups happy. And the stakeholder group is going to continue. Is that correct? Or is it terminal? I have no idea. Okay. Well, if it does, is there a... So no one's kind of charged you with replacing Bill Applegate at this point? Um, he, he, that perspective is valuable. I'll say that. And well, he, we'll, we'll there's miss nobody Bill. that deals with lions more than yeah. him. To my no, mind. no. He, he's, he's a great loss, and, and uh, but, but I can't answer the... the and then the other thing is kind of, I, I keep coming back to it, and you just touched on it, but procedurally and jurisdictionally, um, I can't get away from the fact that, that a mountain lion's not designated as a game animal. It and is it, not. And if it's not, I, and I guess I don't know this, what, what can we and cannot, what can we not do on a species that isn't a game animal to begin with. And, and, and doesn't that, yeah. isn't that really step one or should it be step one? Well, uh, Commissioner Patton, that's an interesting point. Actually, the statute in Texas Parks and Wildlife Code uh, does uh, mandate, says shall uh, create a management plan for non-game uh, animals. So um, you can have a management plan for non-game. Uh, matter of fact, the statute anticipates that. Okay, what about enforcement of of anything? Uh, when you seem like you 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 spent some time talking about voluntary versus mandatory reporting, and mandatory brings into my mind at least enforcement. Um, that does the game animal designation then become important as it relates to that? 
Well, I, I, on enforcement questions, I always defer to Stormy. Okay, well, he's... <laughs> Well, they haven't given me a badge, or they took away my badge, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, Commissioner Patton, while uh, Stormy comes up, this is James Murphy, General Counsel, for the record. <clears throat> In Chapter 67 of the Parks and Wildlife Code, the Commission has broad rulemaking authority um, to, as uh, Chairman Fitzsimmons mentioned, um, any limits on the taking, possession, propagation, transportation, importation, exportation, sale, or offering for sale of non-game fish or wildlife that the department considers necessary to manage the species. In addition to that, you also have authority to, to require the issuance of permits, and under that chapter, there are penalties for violations of your commission regulations. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Sorry, Stormy. Stormy's good at that. Any other questions? Uh, this is Commissioner Bell. Uh, Chairman Fitzsimmons, one, thank you for, for the work that you and the team did on this. I found the report um, very interesting. It seems that a, a couple of the items, in particular um, uh, Charge 4 and Charge 6, are easier to get people to, to rally around as, as a potential implementation rule. And the others all seem to really be data driven. If, if you have the data and perhaps a plan, then very, in various ways, charges one, two, three, and five, I guess, tie into that whole data management plan. Is that, is that your perspective? Yeah, that's a good summary. And, and good news is uh, during this period, uh, of, of the year that we were having our meetings, one of our um, uh, stakeholder group members, uh, Dr. Hewitt, uh, went out and got some, some grant money and put together a lion's study, and two members of the stakeholder group are going to participate uh, in the study with their ranches, including my family and one other member of the stakeholder group. And uh, so we're, we're, we're getting started. We're not waiting on the commission. Commissioner Abel, I think just to follow on Commissioner Bell's comments, we could get bogged down in, in charge one and two with the data collection uh, and wait to do things that I think make sense, sense to do now, such as the you know getting rid of the canned hunts and, and some track, trap check standards. And I think we ought to consider moving forward with that sooner than later. Right. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, uh, Joseph, thank you very much, Juan, for all the work, and we will determine whether or not we need to continue this for another three or four years. <laughs> you, you'd be happy to do that, wouldn't you? There are other former chairmen here who can do the job. No, we love you. But uh, in, in addition, thank you to the advisory group. I, I understand. Joseph, I actually may have a question. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, you typically are the one that cross uh, cross-examine people, right? <laughs> so, uh, but thank you to the advisory group. I know how much time and effort, and it's for the greater good, and you're not getting paid, and you pay your own expenses, and you go to five five different meetings. So I really appreciate your willingness to to work for the state of Texas uh, for, for gratis, so for no gratis. So I appreciate that. And prayers to the Applegate family. Uh, and I, I was reading his comments, and, and I, I, I love this comment, and I think it maybe uh, solidifies exactly what we are as an agency, so much so that I think we should get a plaque with his name on it and maybe deliver it to the family and have one here, but here's what it says. Managing wildlife in a scientific and landowner-friendly manner has made TPWD the most successful game department in the USA, and our wildlife numbers prove it. And, I mean, that is just a fantastic statement, uh, and it's what we do, landowner-friendly but with data. So I just can't thank you guys enough. So real quick, charge one needs more data. Charge two needs more data. Three, the data will lead to a management plan. That seems like a reasonable thing to do. This has been looked at three times in 50 years, and no management plan has ever done. So I would ask that we start working on a management plan. Uh, harvest data, uh, no consensus. Uh, we'll, I, do, I do like the voluntary issue through the, 
the equivalent of the turkey tag. So we should think about how we potentially do a voluntary uh, assessment. That's more data. So maybe the management team can can work on that in terms of how we go about get collecting data because that's I assume is that correct? Uh, yes, but there there may be um, another opportunity there in um, as I say using the, the the MLDP and and wildlife management plan uh, acreage because you look at that those millions of acres they perfectly overlay where the mountain lions are in West Texas and 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 in South Texas. So that's that's a that that's a real opportunity to to do that, and that it's going to require this what I call active voluntary uh, reporting is going to require the commission to allocate resources or reallocate resources to do that. I don't think that's just broad sweep of the hand. That's going to require. Some FTEs. resources. It's going to require okay. FTEs that are doing that. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, let's look at that and see, Do can we get the FTEs needed to do the data collection uh, for purposes of this management plan? Uh, trap check standards, I think, consensus, this is something that needs to be done. Uh, charge 5. Harvest bag limits, once again, uh, that's related to data in the management program. Six, can, can hunts, looks like that's a fairly straightforward thing to, to ban. So uh, I'm not sure what those directives mean. I don't know how the commission needs to vote on that, if they, if they will vote on it. But tell me, what's the protocol? Yeah, Chairman, we just need direction from you, and I think we have the direction. So what I, what I hear is... Um, for those charges about data collection, come back to the commission from the staff with a plan for data collection and additional science and how that leads into permanent management plan. And then the two near-term items are the 36-hour trap check, right? Come back to the commission and share how we're going to get that done as well as the um, canned hunts. And those are the near-term actions as I understand it. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. And, 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 and a plaque to the Applegate family, and let's get them here and uh, make a big deal of it because that, that he, uh, he gave a lot to the, to the advisory group. So, and thank you again, Joseph. I, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, work session item numbers 11 through 16 will be heard in executive session. At this time, I'd like to announce that pursuant to the requirements of Chapter 551, Government Code referred to as the Open Meetings Act, an executive session will be held at this time for the purpose of deliberation of real estate matters under Section 551.072 of the Open Meetings Act and seeking legal advice under Section 551.071 of the Open Meetings Act, including advice regarding pending or, or contemplated litigation. We will now recess for the executive session at uh, 12 10 p.m. Thank you.
Okay, uh, we will now reconvene the work session on January 24th, 2024 at 2.33 p.m. Before we begin, I'll take roll. Chairman Hildebrand here, Vice Chairman Bell. Here. Commissioner Abel. Present. Commissioner Doggett. Present. Mr. Foster. Present. Mr. Galo. Present. Mr. Rowling. Present. Mr. Patton. Thank you. Uh, we're now returning from the executive session where we discuss the work session, real estate item numbers 11 through 15, and litigation item number 16. Commissioner Scott, are you present? I'm present. Okay. All right. We have a full, full team. Uh, if there are no further questions, I'll place items 11 and 12 on the Thursday commission meeting agenda for public comment and action. Regarding items number 13 and 15, I will authorize staff to begin the public notice and input process. Regarding item number 14, exchange of land, Cameron County, acquisition of approximately 477 acres in exchange for approximately 43 acres at Boca, State, uh, Boca Chica State Parks. Uh, Mr. Vick, will you make your presentation? Okay, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name's Trey Vick. I'll be presenting uh, an exchange of land in Cameron County, approximately 477 acres in exchange for approximately 43 acres at Boca Chica State Park. Uh, Boca Chica State Park is in Cameron County. Uh, this map shows the Boca Chica State Park, uh, the red star. Uh, the subject property, uh, the acquisition is the blue star to the north. Uh, Boca Chica State Park was acquired by the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department in 1994 and until recently was leased to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which managed it as a unit at the Lower Rio Grande Valley uh, National Wildlife Refugee. Uh, SpaceX Exploration Technologies Corp., known as SpaceX, uh, desires to expand its operational footprint around its launch facilities at Boca Chica and is arrested requested a transfer of 43 acres from Boca Chica State Park in exchange for 477 acres near Laguna Ascasa NWR to TPWD. Uh, this acquisition will provide increased public recreational opportunities, including hiking, camping, water recreation, and wildlife viewing, and allow for a greater conservation of sensitive habitats for wintering and migratory birds. Additionally, this land is within the broader conservation landscape of the lower Rio Grande Valley of Texas. Uh, here's a site map of the proposed acquisition outlined in yellow. And this is a, a map of Boca Chica State Park in green and in orange. Uh, the exchange tracks are outlined in green. <coughs> Uh, as of uh, this afternoon, we've received 1,302 comments, uh, 1,039 opposed, uh, and 263 uh, in support of. And that includes a letter from uh, County Judge Eddie Trevino, Jr., and a letter from um, uh, the Sierra Club, both in opposition. Uh, the request today is for TPWD staff uh, to put this item on Thursday agenda for public comment and action. I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vick. Any questions of Mr. Vick of the transaction? Okay. Uh, well, uh, I've, got, I've got a few um, Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think provided that there's comments both in support and in opposition to item nine, the, the commission believes that really the appropriate action should, this should be taken up at the March commission meeting as part of our two meeting standard. We don't want to deviate from the standard protocol that uh, we use to acquire acreage. Uh, and we think as well withdrawing the item uh, allows for more transparency, more public comments uh, to be provided on that uh, the exchange of the land. Uh, I will say, though, the land exchange is a extremely valuable opportunity 
to the Department of the State of Texas to provide more recreational opportunities to the public. I am committed to moving this process forward and completing the transaction. The opportunity to expand, expand our park system through this land swap is of essential importance to the state of Texas. So we'll put that on the agenda for the March meeting, correct? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, let's see. Regarding item number 16, litigation update, no further action is needed at this time. So, Director Yaskowitz, are there any other issues that we have outstanding for today? No, sir. Okay. Let me read concluding. Uh, let's see. All right. Hold on. I apologize. Um, some here. Uh, hold on. Okay. Uh, simple. Uh, Dr. Yaskowitz, the uh, commission has completed uh, its work session business, and I declare us adjourned at 2.40 p.m. Thank you very much, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.